Hi guys, welcome to this complete blockchain tutorial by Simply Learn. My name is Sandeep and in the next few hours, we'll be teaching you everything you need to know about blockchain. Guiding you on this learning journey is Saurabh, our industry expert with over 5 years of experience in the field of blockchain, bitcoin and other cryptocurrencies. First off, we'll go through a short animated introduction to blockchain, followed by a tutorial on how blockchain works. We'll then teach you about what a cryptocurrency is and the different types of cryptocurrencies in the market available to you. Next, we'll teach you about Ethereum and how smart contracts work. Then, you will learn about the process of Bitcoin mining and how Bitcoin wallets work. After that, we'll look into how Ethereum and Bitcoin are different from each other. Then, we will tell you about the 5 industries blockchain will disrupt, followed by 10 things you probably didn't know about Bitcoin. We will then talk about some of the popular applications of blockchain and how you can become a blockchain developer. And finally, we have handpicked 30 of the most important questions you might face in a blockchain interview. Before we begin, make sure to subscribe to our channel and click on the bell icon to never miss an update from Simply Learn. With that out of the way, let's look at our animated video. Ever wonder if there's an easier way to complete transactions without having to deal with online wallets, banks, and third-party applications? Well, it's possible thanks to blockchain. Here's everything you need to know about blockchain. Imagine four friends, Jack, Ted, Sam, and Phil meet up for dinner. After they're done, Jack pays the bill, and all of them decide to split the expense amongst each other. Now, on the next day, when Phil sends his share to Jack via online money transfer, the transaction goes through without a hitch. Then, Ted and Sam send their respective shares to Jack, but their transactions don't go through. The failed transaction cites some issues at the bank. That's when Jack comes to know about the many ways a bank transaction could fail. It could be due to technical issues at the bank, one of their accounts were hacked, daily transfer limits being exceeded, and sometimes additional charges, like transfer charges associated with transferring money. To solve these problems, the concept of cryptocurrency came into existence. Cryptocurrencies are a form of digital or virtual currency that run on a technology known as blockchain. Thanks to blockchain, cryptocurrencies are immune to counterfeiting, don't require a central authority, and are protected by strong and complex encryption algorithms. And in a market of more than thousands of cryptocurrencies like Litecoin, Ethereum, Zcash, and so on, one reigns supreme, Bitcoin. Now, let's go back to our previous example and have Phil, Ted, and Sam send Jack two Bitcoins each as their contribution to the previous night's dinner. Let's assume Phil, Ted, and Sam have three Bitcoins in reserve, while Jack has five. First, Phil sends two Bitcoins to Jack. A record is created in the form of a block. The transaction details between them is permanently inscribed in this block. This record also holds the number of Bitcoins each of the friends own. So, after Phil's transaction, Jack has seven Bitcoins while Phil has one. Following this, Sam and Ted send two Bitcoins to Jack. A new block is created for each of these transactions. These blocks hold the transaction details as well as how many Bitcoins Sam, Ted, and Jack have in reserve. These blocks are linked to each other, as each of them takes reference from the previous one for the number of Bitcoins each friend owns. This chain of records or blocks is called a ledger, and this ledger is shared among all the friends, which acts as a public distributed ledger. This forms the basis of blockchain. So, what happens when Phil has only one Bitcoin left and he tries to send two more Bitcoins to Jack? The transaction will not go through. This is because all his friends have copies of the ledger and it's clear that Phil has only one Bitcoin left. His friends will flag this transaction as invalid. A hacker will not be able to alter the data in the blockchain because each user has a copy of the ledger. The data within the blocks are encrypted by complex algorithms. All of this is made possible with the help of blockchain technology. Blockchain can be described as a collection of records linked with each other, strongly resistant to alteration, and protected using cryptography. Now, let's have a closer look at the Bitcoin transaction between Jack and Phil and find out how it works. Every user in the Bitcoin network has two keys, a public key and a private key. The public key is an address that everyone in the network knows of, like an email address of a user. The private key 
is a unique address that only the user has knowledge of, something like a password. First, Bill passes the number of bitcoins he wants to send to Jack, along with his and Jack's unique wallet address through a hashing algorithm. All of this is part of the transaction details. These details are encrypted using encryption algorithms and using Phil's unique private key. This is done to digitally sign the transaction and to indicate that the transactions came from Phil. This output is now transmitted across the world using Jack's public key. With this, the message or transaction can be decrypted only by Jack's private key which only Jack has knowledge of. Different cryptocurrencies use different hashing algorithms. While Bitcoin uses the SHA-256 algorithm, Ethereum, which is also a famous cryptocurrency, uses one known as Ethash. This transaction and several other similar ones are taking place all around the world. These transactions are validated and then added block by block. The people who validate these blocks are called miners. For a block to be validated, and added to a blockchain. Miners need to solve a complex mathematical problem. The miner who solves this first adds the block to the blockchain and is rewarded with 12.5 bitcoins. The process of solving the complex mathematical problem is called proof of work, and the process of adding a block to the blockchain is called mining. With this, Phil and Jack's wallets are updated, just like every person in the network who has completed a transaction. Now that you know about blockchain and its important concepts, time for a small quiz. What is the concept of blockchain that ensures data cannot be altered by any of the users within the network? A. Public distributed ledger B. Proof of work C. Proof of stake D. Hash encryption Let us know what you think is the right answer in the comments below. I'm hoping you guys enjoyed this. Now we have Saurabh to tell us about blockchain. Hello everyone and welcome to this session of blockchain. My name is Saurabh and I'm part of the Simply Learn team. So let's get started. So what's in it for you today? We are here to understand the concepts of why do we need blockchain? What is Bitcoin and blockchain? How does blockchain work? Concepts around blockchain like SHA-256 encryption, public and private key, distributed public ledger concept, the proof of work and mining. Then we will also look at different applications of blockchain in different industries, who uses blockchain and a demo. Now, why we need blockchain? Imagine there are two entities, A and B, living far away and want to transfer money to each other. One is in America and one is in Asia. As of today, in order to transfer the money, they rely on a third party on which they have to trust. Now, what are the possible results by doing this way? Any transaction. There are high transaction fees associated with it. There could be problem of double spending. There could be internet based frauds and poor data recovery. Now, let's see what does all these means. High transaction fee. For any transaction, bank will charge a relatively very high amount of transaction fee as compared to what as of today cryptocurrency charges. Double spending. Double spending is a digital error where money can be spent twice from your account. So for example, if you have $800 in your account and you might end up spending $1000, which is an invalid transaction. Hackers might attack financial institutions and gain unauthorized access to steal your money. Poor data recovery. Retrieving lost data is very difficult in a centralized system as there is only a single copy of information. But as compared to the distributed databases, the distributed ledger technology like blockchain, it is easy as the information is distributed across multiple nodes. Now these problems can be solved using Bitcoin and blockchain technology and we will see how. So let's first understand what is Bitcoin and blockchain. Bitcoin. Bitcoin is a digital currency which is used to send and receive money across the world. It is a barrier free currency in a decentralized manner with minimum transfer fee or we can say it's going to be relatively very very less as compared to what bank charges. It doesn't involve a third party. No intermediaries are involved thereby reducing the cost of transaction. Fast and cheap transfer is possible. Personal information identity of a user is hidden and all the transactions are cryptographically secure as they are being signed using your private key. 
Bitcoin does this by storing and transacting the money over a distributed peer-to-peer -peer network called blockchain. So therefore, it becomes very important for us in order to understand if how Bitcoin works, we also need to understand what is blockchain because that is the underlying technology. So what is blockchain? Blockchain is a distributed database of immutable records called blocks which are secured using cryptography now here we can see once the data is recorded it cannot be changed it cannot be altered and that is the attribute of immutability of blockchain a block is a record book which contains the details of transactional data every block is given an aggregated set of transactions to be validated verified and added to itself so basically a block consists of four primary details which we will take a look at it contains the hash of a previous block it contains an aggregated list of transactions it also contains the value of nonce and the hash for the block itself which itself is like a digital signature of the block so hash of previous block it holds the hash value of the previous block to which it is connected contains details of several transactions which are aggregated in this block nonce nonce is a random number a random value which is generated to derive a hash value which should be less than the target decided for the block and hash is alphanumeric value which is used to identify the block itself and it is unique now let's deep dive into blockchain blockchain creates a chain of blocks as we can see here in a blockchain the previous hash value of a block is always equal to the hash value of its previous block so as we can see here the previous hash value of block number two is 23a which is the hash value of block one also the previous hash value of block one is zero because it is the first block in the blockchain and it is called the genesis block so the first block is called the genesis block and does not have any previous hash value so consider an example now where a person tries to tamper the block block number two when he will try to change the hash of block number two will change thereby the previous hash value of block number three now does not stand valid now the hash value of block two and block three does not match which will make the following blocks the blocks ahead of block number two invalid now this particular feature of blockchain helps us eliminate data tampering now let's see how does blockchain work jack wants to send money to elsa the requested transaction of jack wanting to send money to elsa will be sent to all the peer nodes on the network of computers now the transaction sent to nodes is verified by a set of people or a typical set of nodes called miners once verified the transaction is combined with other transactions to create a new block in the blockchain and as a result the receiving party elsa receives the amount in blockchain a transaction could be for a cryptocurrency for data or any kind of asset so the transaction can be for any digital asset which holds value on the network now let's take a look at what are the typical features of blockchain these are typical features of blockchain it involves sha256 algorithm based encryption proof of work consensus algorithm usage of public and private key in order to sign the messages on the network the role of miners in order to validate and verify the transactions and how to create a now a distributed public ledger now what is sha256 encryption for a transaction blockchain uses cryptographic keys to secure identities and hash function to make the blockchain unalterable so cryptographic keys includes two kind of keys private and public key and it uses a hash function which includes sha256 now sha256 stands for the number of bit it takes up in memory secure hashing algorithm now hash function takes an input data and always return an alphanumeric output of 64 characters which is 256 bits so as you can see over here if you feed any data like we are here feeding an example of welcome to simply learn the hashing function will return you 256 bit value 
and now that hash value is unique the value returned by a hash function is called hash value it is impossible to decode the original message using the hash value itself so hash value does not discloses the original message in the hash function a minor change in the input data will result in a different hash value and that is the unique feature of the hashing function you make a small change and the hashing value will change altogether completely now SHA-256 is a one-way function you give an input pass it through the hashing function you get the output but the reverse is not possible so in simple terms decrypting back the original text is not possible using SHA-256 which makes it very very secure now cryptography uses public and private trees to encrypt and decrypt data but a private key is always kept secret with the user so if i have to send a message to someone i will sign it with my private key which is secret to me but i'll share my public key in order for users to decrypt the message and validate that yes the sender of the message is me so in the blockchain network public key can be shared with all the bitcoin users in order to do the transaction so let's take a look what is the entire verification process so when you initiate a transaction it is passed through a hashing function which in our case is sha256 the output is passed through a signature algorithm with the user's private key again and then we receive a digitally signed document so the hashing output plus my private key is used to generate a digitally signed document which is then floated on the network with my public key then the encrypted output is distributed to the bitcoin network using the public key so the digitally signed document and the public key is used by the miners to verify the transaction and once that is done they include the transaction on the block and the transaction is then marked as completed so what is distributed public ledger a blockchain is a distributed ledger in which the digital data is recorded and verified by each node for preventing tempering of data so if you can see over here we have a network of nodes and amongst these nodes few might be the miners who are taking the responsibility of verifying and validating the transactions on each block and in lieu of that verification they will be rewarded so we will see when we will be talking about mining so let's take an example over here jack is sending 10 btc to El elsa now which is verified by john in the network john is the miner now once the transaction is verified by john the result is being broadcasted is transferred to other nodes as a result the block becomes valid and gets added to the blockchain and once it is transferred to other nodes the ledger of each node records this transaction and all the ledgers now have the same information on the network to note only a valid transaction is propagated across the bitcoin users while if any invalid transaction is identified it is discarded at the first node itself which received it now what if any user tries to tamper the data every user in the blockchain maintains a copy of the ledger so as i said once the transactions are verified they are distributed across the nodes all the ledgers are updated now if someone goes back in the blockchain and tries to tamper the data in one of the blocks the other nodes will be able to identify the invalid block and will discard it so if anyone tries to modify the data the alternate transaction copies with other users will negate the alteration now let's take a look at the proof of work algorithm proof of work is a consensus algorithm which is used in the bitcoin network it is the process to determine a number called as nonce along with the cryptographic hashing algorithm to produce a hash value lower than the predefined target for the block so if you see over here the miners main task is to identify the nonce which is the random number in order to generate the hash value which is less than the target now generally the target is something like the hash value should have leading zeros like here in the example we can see it is having leading zeros of two leading zeros so in order to generate a hash value with leading zeros like two or three it takes huge amount of computing power for the miners to determine that so in order to determine the norms the miners need to try about 20.6 quadrillion norms values to get a one valid hash now how it works 
transaction data is distributed across the users of Bitcoin network. Miners will validate the unverified transactions, add them to the block. That is their task. To do so, miners compete to solve a difficult mathematical puzzle, which is the generation of the nonce value based on cryptographic hashing function. And this whole process is known as proof of work. The first miner who solves the puzzle gets rewarded. And this is the purpose for which the miner has made the investment in the hardware, in the computing power, the energy which the mining machine is consuming in order to get the reward. Once the miner has verified the block, it is added to the blockchain. Now let's take a look at the process. Using the SHA-256, you generate a hash value. Use nonce as an input to the hashing function. If the hash value is less than the target, no, then you modify the nonce value. You repeat this activity. If it is uh, less than the target value, yes, then you are deemed to get the reward. Your puzzle is solved. Note, in the Bitcoin network, the target is adjusted every 2016 blocks. So as I mentioned, the target of having leading three zeros or having leading four zeros, that is revised after every 2016 blocks. On an average, a block is mined every 10 minutes. The difficulty of the puzzle is maintained in such a way that it never deviates too much from the average time taken to mine a block. Now, candidate block proof of work. So let's consider an example where a miner Jack is competing to validate the block number 1000. Now while Jack was mining block number 1000, he was also listening for new transactions. So in the transaction pool, the transactions are stored, they are basically parked until they get verified and gets included in a new block. Now, unfortunately, before Jack could mine 1000, someone else mined it and earned the reward. Now block 1000 has a valid proof of work now. It is a verified block. So now Jack will start constructing a candidate block which will be now on the subsequent block sequential 1001 by gathering the unverified transaction now from the transaction pool. So Jack has now started creating a candidate block pulling the transactions from the transaction pool into block number 1001. The current block now is the candidate block because it has not been validated and does not have any proof of work yet. This block 1001 gets validated once any miner succeeds in solving the proof of work. It could be Jack or it could be again someone else competing. Mining. In blockchain, when the transaction contained are considered confirmed, a new block is added to the existing blockchain and the bitcoins concerned in the transaction now can be spent. Now as of today, the miner who solves a puzzle gets a reward of 12.5 bitcoins. The amount of bitcoin rewarded for each block added to the blockchain is half for every 2,10,000 blocks which is approximately every 4 year. So this is called the huffing concept of bitcoin. So approximately whenever the 4 year threshold will be reached the reward will get reduced to 6.25 bitcoins. Now let's take a look of applications of blockchain in different industries. Voting. Blockchain is a, is a very trustworthy mechanism which has increased transparency in the voting process. Supply chain uses the attributes of blockchain of provenance and traceability to detect, to identify and trace the supply of any asset from its point of origin to its final destination. And if in due course any defect is detected, it can easily identify where in the journey of the asset the defect was generated. Insurance has a huge adoption. They are utilizing blockchain for eliminating forgery and preventing false claims. As all the records and transactions will be maintained in blockchain immutable ledger, it will be very difficult for anyone to apply for any false claim. So as an example, if the health records are there on blockchain, the insurance companies can easily validate the health claims made by any patient through the blockchain digital records. Accounting. It virtually maintains a record of accurate financial information. All the financial transactions, if maintained on an immutable ledger, can easily be validated and verified and makes accounting simple. Now, who uses blockchain? There are organizations across the globe who are adopting and have started using blockchain. Example, Walmart. Due to blockchain's decentralized system, the company is able to protect its data from hacking and data alteration. British Airways with blockchain, 
flight data from various sources are merged together and help passengers receive accurate information. Maersk with blockchain, the company is able to provide an efficient, transparent and secure service in global trade. Brilliant Earth, in order to track and trace the provenance of high value gemstones, they are using blockchain. Now let's take a look at a demo. Let's go over through some concepts which we have just learned. Now here I want to demonstrate a usage of the hashing function. So as we had learned the hashing function is a 256 bit hashing function SHA256. You can type in any data and it will always generate a 256 bit hash and it's going to be unique. It's a one way function so it is not possible that you will be able to derive the data from the hash value. And if I type the same data, it will generate the same hash value. So the hash value for blank is the same. And if I type anything, it will always generate the same hash value for the same data set. Now let's see how can we use the hashing function in our block. Now here we have a block which has its attributes which is the block number, a nonce value and like the similar hashing function we have the data set and a hash value. Now the difficulty level, the target is already set for the hashing function to have four leading zeros. So whenever I will be mining, the job of the miner here is to generate a hash which should have four leading zeros in the hash value and it will use, it will guess the nonce value in order to generate such a hash which is having four leading zeros. So suppose if I type a data set, now the hash which is right now you are seeing on the screen is not mined and it does not have the leading zeros, the four leading zeros. So when I will click mine, the nonce value will change. The miner has to guess the nonce value to get the hash which is having four leading zeros. Here it is. So the nonce which is generated now, which is 57,480. It takes huge amount of time processing power. So it could have gone a pretty high value, but it was able to guess it at a decent amount of time. Now, as soon as I'll change the value again, the block has turned pink, which means it is not verified. The hash has to be generated. Now we will see the same concept. We will have multiple blocks in our blockchain. Now here we have multiple blocks but we have a new extra attribute called previous hash. So if you notice the blocks right now currently have all the previous values of the hash which are of their previous blocks. Block number 2 has the previous hash value of 4015 which is the hash value of its previous block. And this is how a typical blockchain is constructed. Now there are few things to be noted here. Suppose I modify the data in the last block. So if you see the block hash now needs to be changed because the data has changed. Its hash has to be regenerated. So the previous hash value is the same which was the hash value of the previous block. Now the new hash has been generated for this block which starts with four leading zeros. Another thing to be noted is suppose I go back in the sequence and modify the data of any of the previous blocks. So all the blocks ahead of this block number three now have to be verified again because the signature of block number three has changed. Therefore, the values of the previous hash have to be updated for block number four and five. So when I'll mine block number three, it has now generated a hash value which is as per the target, block number four also has to be mined and block number five also has to be mined. Now this way we have created our valid blockchain. So this demonstrates if someone in a regular blockchain, a mainnet blockchain which has high number of blockchains, blocks, so if they go and tamper any block in the past, all the subsequent blocks ahead of that block have to be mined again, which will take huge, huge amount of time and processing power, which makes it impossible. Now we will see this concept when we'll take this concept of distributed. Now here we have a distributed ledger. We have three peers, peer A, peer B, peer C, all have the same copy of the ledgers. Now suppose there is someone who has modified the data on peer A and generated a block, updated the block, but the hash value of block in peer A for block number 5 is different 
for what is of block number 5 at peer P, peer B which is the 4 times 0 E4 and peer C also has the same hash signature for as peer B. So easily the participants in the distributed network will able to be identify that someone has modified block number 5 at peer A which is not a valid block and it can get disregarded. Now whatever example I have been showing this has all been random data we can take a look at the typical transaction which actually happens on a Bitcoin network. Now rather than sending random data, we can see here the exact examples of the transactions, the transfer of money which actually happens from one account to another. So this is a very good way to see that these are the ways typically the transactions are aggregated and mined in a block. And we can see in a typical fashion all the three peers have the same set of information on the distributed ledger. Now if I modify any of the transaction the block will get invalidated and it would have to be remined. Blockchain tutorial part 1. So let's get started and understand what's in it for us today. So let's take an hypothesis in a city not so far away somebody was up to something bad. So there is a hacker who hates the bank who wants to steal the money of all the people lying in the bank. Now here's why I hate them even more. What are the nuances and the problem areas of the banking system? The banking system has higher transactional and international transfer costs. A lot of documentation is required for setting up of an account, for opening an account and onboarding a customer. And the banking system is not always accessible. It's not 24 by 7. It's closed on banking holidays and it has other limitations also like transfer limits in a day and you know you can't transfer X amount within a stipulated time. Now banks in such an ecosystem acts as a center point of failure. It is a centralized based system which is prone to failure from a centralized point of view. So if the bank fails all the transactions will come to an halt which are dependent on the bank. Now let's see what happens if the hacker is able to get into the banking system and hacks the bank. All the investors or the people associated with the bank the information associated with them will get corrupted will get jeopardized and it can lead to huge losses to the bank and to the individuals and all this can happen with a click of a button. It's as simple as that. So once a hacker has access to the system, he can manipulate the system, compromise the information, share it with the parties which are not supposed to have that information and lot can go wrong. Though the hackers can be caught, right? It is possible through cyber security and various means. But once the information is compromised, it is very difficult to roll that back. And that's why we need more secure systems and systems which are not dependent on a centralized authority which work in a more decentralized fashion thereby making it hack proof plus lowering the transaction cost also. Now this incident of course will catch the bank manager's attention. Now he will go to his advisors and want to make sure this does not happen again. So the technology people, the advisors will make sure that this does not happen. But what is the remedy? So the remedy is setting up a blockchain. Now of course the manager who is looking into the banking functions might not be aware of the technology and what benefits blockchain bring onto the table in order to prevent such an incident. So that's what we are here for. We will learn before we go and understand what can blockchain actually achieve for us. So we will understand today what is blockchain, the Bitcoin story, the features of blockchain like public distributed ledger, the hashing encryption, the proof of work consensus algorithm and the concept of mining. And then we will cover up a use case where how blockchain can be used for banking operations. Now what is blockchain? Blockchain is a list of records called blocks which stores data publicly and in a chronological order and the entire information is persisted using cryptography. It is secured using cryptography. So cryptography ensures that the privacy of the user is maintained and data cannot be altered. Information on a blockchain network is not controlled by a centralized authority. So unlike modern financial institutions, nobody controls the data within a blockchain. The data is maintained by the participants of the network and they are the democratic authority in order to approve any transaction which can happen on a blockchain network. Access to anyone on the network. So a typical blockchain network is a public blockchain. So as long as you have access to the network, you have access to the data within the blockchain. If you are a participant, 
on the blockchain network you will have the same copy of the ledger which all other participants have so therefore everyone every participant on the network has the same copy of the data so everyone in the network has a copy of the blockchain data which is used for ensuring that data remains untampered so even if one node or data on one particular participant computer gets corrupted the other participants will come to know immediately that this particular instance or node has gone corrupted and they will rectify it as soon as possible so basically the question is is this the same technology that bitcoin works on and the answer is yes bitcoin could not have been possible without blockchain so we will understand how bitcoin adopted blockchain in order to reach to its journey today so bitcoin was introduced in 2009 by someone or a group of people known as satoshi nakamoto it aimed to solve the problem faced by fiat currencies with the help of blockchain technology now as of today in 2018 there are more than 1600 cryptocurrencies that follow the concepts of bitcoin and blockchain for example the other popular cryptocurrencies are like ethereum litecoin dash ripple and many more now let me explain how a bitcoin transaction works the sender transmits the transaction details worldwide basically whenever a sender has to do a transaction he has to send bitcoins to a receiver he will submit the transaction on the public blockchain network of bitcoin and transmit it now verification to authenticate users it is done by the miners around the world so basically there are specific participants in the bitcoin network which are called as miners whose job is to verify the authenticity of the sender and the receiver and also validate whether the sender has the right amount of balance for the bitcoin which he is trying to send to the receiver and ensuring that the sanity of the underlying blockchain network to the bitcoin remains correct and not get corrupted so once the miner has authenticated the transaction verified all the parameters the transaction is added to a block and then that block is made part of the main blockchain once the block is added to the blockchain the money the transactions which were associated in the block then gets executed money is deducted from the sender's wallet and is added to the receiver wallet thereby once the transaction is completed the block is added and the ledger across all the nodes are updated each and every participant ledger copy is updated with the particular block which has been added in the blockchain so therefore all the participants have the same copy of the information now so what makes blockchain special now these are the special four features of blockchain which we are going to talk about in detail it is a public distributed ledger it works using a hashing encryption each and every block has a hash value which is the digital signature of the block all the transactions are approved and verified on the blockchain network using proof of work consensus algorithm and the blockchain network utilizes the resources of the miners who are there to validate the transaction and the miners in lieu of putting up investing in their resources and validating the transactions get rewards in terms of bitcoin and that process is called mining now public distributed ledger so let's imagine four friends sharing a particular document amongst each other correct now if there was only a single copy of that document and one of them altered the data it may go unnoticed however the outcome would be different if each one of them had a copy of the data so therefore if each and every participant has the same copy of the data even if one of them change the data the others would find that the data does not match with their own blockchain works in a similar fashion the data within a blockchain is accessible to everyone so with this as long as you are part of the network you could access the entire history of transactions that have taken place since the blockchain was created since inception and the first block in any blockchain is called the genesis block so from the genesis block to the current block you will have the access to the entire chain any additions to blockchain have to be approved by the participant users in the blockchain network so a majority of the members within the network have to approve of any additions to the blockchain this is the public part of the ledger and this is important because any additions made to the blockchain are permanent and are immutable so immutable transactions are the transactions which cannot be altered once registered they cannot be modified and are available for audit and verification 24 by 7 
So this means that each and every detail is recorded and any alterations can be detected by verifying it against everyone's personal version of the blockchain. So if someone's tried to modify a data on a block on a particular node, then the other ledgers which are having the same information will come to know that someone has modified data on a one particular node and they will try to rectify it. And the fourth property, no central authority is controlling the working of this blockchain network. It is a decentralized network. So this is where being decentralized helps. Everyone has a copy of the blockchain, which means there is no central point of failure. There is a single source of truth. Even if things go wrong, the data can be recovered. If one node goes wrong, the data can be recovered from other nodes. But what about security? How is privacy maintained if everything is so public? And here hashing encryptions comes into picture. It takes care of that. So now we will talk about the second feature which is hashing encryption. But to understand hashing encryption, we need to understand the contents. What are the contents of a block? So a block in a blockchain is like a container that holds aggregated transactions. It contains certain set of transactions. So we will see what all things construct a particular block. So a block has two parts. It has a header and it has the second part is the transaction details. It is the set of transactions which are aggregated in this block. Now the header has following set of attributes. It has the block version number. It has the hash of the previous block to which it is linked, the current timestamp, the timestamp at which the block was verified, the nonce, nonce, we will see what is the attribute, what is the meaning of nonce and the target value. Now the transaction details are nothing but the example which we talked about earlier. It is the transaction which the sender and receiver are sharing. The sender is trying to send certain amount of Bitcoin from his account to the receiver's account. Now it is represented in the form of a 256 bit hash value in the header called as Merkle root or the hash root. So basically the Merkle root is the hash of all the transactions structured in a Merkle tree called binary tree. It's a kind of a binary tree and the hash value of the root node of the Merkle tree is called the Merkle root hash. So the transaction details of a block are contained in the header in a hex value known as Merkle root. The Merkle root can be calculated in this way. So basically the list of transaction, each transaction is passed through a hashing algorithm then all the hashes of the transactions are paired and then again passed through another hashing algorithm until only one value remains and which will be the root now let me tell you how a hash function works blockchain utilizes a hash function to perform cryptography data from a data set of random size is sent as input to a hashing function to get an encrypted value of fixed size and that is the feature of any hashing function so some unique properties of hashing function are these are deterministic the same input will always produce the same hash output small changes in the data can drastically change the output so basically any small change to the input produces an output that's drastically different from its previous obtained outputs. It can be computed easily. The output values can be obtained without a whole lot of calculation and hashing functions are one way functions. Basically, you won't be able to determine the input based on the output value. So you can't do the reverse calculation. Now let's go back to our block we were talking about earlier. So as we were discussing what are the features in the header, the previous hash is the resultant hash of the previous block in the blockchain and this is the way two blocks are linked together. Now transaction details, these are used to provide details about the sender, receiver and how much money they want to exchange between them and this is a list of transactions and they are structured in a Merkle tree and the hash of the Merkle root is put in the header. Nonce is a value that is varied to create a unique hash address of the block which should be less than the target hash value. So this is the structure of the header. It has a block version number, basically the sequence number of the block. It has the hash of the previous block, the timestamp when the block was mined and verified, the nonce value. The header is then, this entire header is then passed through a hashing algorithm. In the case of a Bitcoin network, it is SHA-256 and a hash value is generated. And now this hash value becomes the hash value of the block. Now this value is a 256 bit value that is used to uniquely identify the particular block. 
So SHA 256 ensures that alterations to data can be easily detected. So for example, consider these two blocks in the blockchain. They have a similar structure and definitely different hash values. Now if someone alters the transaction details in the first block, the corresponding hash value of the block would change too. Now the values of hash value of the first block and the previous hash value of the other block will not match. Basically the block subsequent to the hacked block will get delinked. Now this will raise an alarm among the users informing them that data alteration has taken place. The users will then be able to flag the block. So the alteration can be easily identified and rectified immediately. To ensure security, blockchain also include digital signatures. These ensure that the message come from the right identity, right person and that the message is not tampered with. Users are provided their own private and public key. So whenever a user onboard a public blockchain, he is provided a pair of public and private key. Now private key is used by the user to control his her own account. This is kept as a secret by the user. So basically it is like his own password and public key. Public key is used to identify the user on the network. This is shared by the user along with the transaction on the network for others to verify. So these are the steps involved in creating and authenticating a digital signature. So at the sender side, the message to be transmitted is passed through the hashing algorithm. In, in this case of Bitcoin, it is SHA-256 and the hash is generated plus the private key is used to generate a digital signature. Now this output is passed through a signature algorithm along with the user's private key to create a digital signature. Now during the transmission, the user's message, their digital fingerprint which was generated in the previous step plus the public key are transmitted across the network. So these three things are published on the network for the validators, for the miners to use and verify the authenticity of the sender. Now at the receiver's end, first the message is passed through a hashing algorithm. Now at the same time, the sender's public key and his or her digital signature are passed through a verification algorithm. Now both the functions will generate a hash. If both the hashes are compared and if they match, then the transaction and the identity of the sender is approved. Otherwise, it is rejected. So basically, this is the process by comparing the hash values to authenticate the identity of the sender. Now, what about the people who verify these transactions and how do they actually do it? So remember that one field in the block header called norms that becomes very important in order to verify the transaction. So now we will talk about the third feature which is the proof of work consensus algorithm. So proof of work involves people around the world, the participants in the network called miners competing to be the first one to add a block to the blockchain. And in lieu of this, they will be rewarded. There are competing miners around the world. They are trying to solve a mathematical puzzle to be the first one to be rewarded and to add a block to the blockchain. So this is the reward. So thereby they invest in the computing power. They invest in the resources in order to mine and validate a transaction to get that reward. Now, what is the mathematical puzzle? So basically they need to find a hash value that satisfies certain predefined conditions. Now, in order to find the hash value, they will use norms. So this target hash value is decided months in advance for every block. The miners keep variating the nonce value to find out an output that falls within the target requirement. So they keep on generating a hash value using the nonce and if it is less than the target, the hash value is accepted and if it is greater than the hash value is rejected, the miner's effort is not considered valid. Now, a miner transmits across the world that he has found a nonce that satisfies the target requirement as soon as he finds it. And thanks to the hashing algorithm used, this claim can be easily verified by others. So basically, the proof of work algorithm, it is very hard to generate the nonce and get the hash value, but it is very easy to verify the transaction by the other miners. So that's a whole lot of work. What a miner's payoff is. 
so for all his or her hard work they get paid in the bitcoins and this is the only way the bitcoins get added to the network sometimes they get other forms of remuneration as well and this is the concept of mining so the entire process when the miner has done the proof of work consensus they are rewarded and this is called as mining so mining is the process of adding a block to the blockchain this miner is the first person who found a nonce value that fell within the target requirement right now for doing this the miner is rewarded as of today on the bitcoin network a miner is paid 12.5 bitcoins for adding a block onto the blockchain but the reward a miner gets reduced by half every 4 years so when the fourth year will approach for the threshold the bitcoin reward will go down to 6.25 bitcoins and the miners also get the sum of all the transaction fees for that particular block so the 12.5 bitcoin reward is justified as mining is a very expensive process it has a heavy toll on electricity computing power and other resources on which the miner has invested now we will take a look at the use cases where blockchain is applicable in banks So we have been incorporating a program where banks can validate user identity. Now, as of now, a user needs to do the process over and over again in each bank. He has to go and prove the identity in each bank. Is there a way we can ease the process with blockchain? And the answer is yes, we can. We will be using Truffle, Ethereum, Ganache, and smart contracts. All of these blockchain technology ecosystem to make it work. and welcome to this demo for how to build your kyc blockchain application now i'm going to show you all the steps required to deploy your kyc application what all components are to be developed and how to go about deploying and testing your application so primarily this kyc application will allow banks to do a decentralized kyc of the customers which come to their banks so in the demo we will see when a customer walks into the initiating bank will do the kyc for a customer enter its details and verify it and if any subsequent bank wants to use the kyc done by another bank he or she needs to take the permission of the customer and then he can use the same kyc for verification so we will see how can we do that so just to start off with we have developed a kyc solidity contract which has all the necessary functions in order to do the actions required for doing a kyc of a particular entity by the bank now once this contract is ready we will be placing it in our sample truffle package so this is my truffle package and in this i have the contracts folder in the contracts folder i have kept my kyc.sol file now in the command prompt i will compile my contract we can ignore the warnings So here is my Ganache client, which I have just started. And in my Ganache client, as you can see, it is running on port 8545, and it has already given me 10 accounts pre-funded with 100 ETH. Now I had already mentioned that my Truffle is connected to local host 8545. So now when I'll do my Truffle migrate command, it will connect to my Ganache and deploy my KYC contract. So now I can go to Truffle Console, and for me, it's very important to see at which particular address my Solidity contract has been deployed. I'll copy it, and in my UI code under root JS contract details dot JS, I will make the change of this address where my contract has now been deployed. Now, after doing these steps, my application is ready to interact with my Solidity contract, which is being deployed on my local blockchain network. Now, as you can see, when I deployed the contract, this is my primary account from which the ethers were deducted in order to deploy the contract. Now, there are certain steps in order to get the application up and running. so first we need to sign up the banks so suppose i say bank 1 and the password should be the first address of the bank so basically we are associating one bank with one account which we have on our ethereum network so we will sign up now bank 1 is successfully registered so now in order to log in i can check 
now bank 1 i have logged in now i need to do add a kyc for a particular customer Now after filling the basic details, I will create the customer and the username I have kept is customer1. Ideally this is the unique identity of the customer. It can be any social security number or the Aadhaar number or any unique identity which is attached to the customer or the email ID and can be used as the unique identifier for the customer. Now once customer profile is successfully created, we need to log in as a customer to allow this bank to see the KYC details. Now suppose if I say customer 1 and search it, it is saying access denied and take the permission from customer to proceed. So before the bank can do the KYC complete, the customer need to approve it. So I am creating the credentials for the customer. Now customer can see his details whatever were filled by bank 1 and he can see that there is a request from bank 1 to allow to view his KYC. Now before we allow I will also create another bank bank 2 and associate it with my another address and try to log in with it. Now bank 2 is also logged in. Now bank 2 has not done the original KYC right but it is trying to look up and its access is also denied so it needs to explicitly take permission. So the bank will take explicit request from the customer. So now the customer has request from bank 1 and bank 2 for the KYC. It is up to the customer whether he or she wants to allow and deny the KYC request. After the permission has been granted, then only the banks can be able to view the KYC. So if I say bank 1 allow and bank 2 deny, now all the requests are done from the queue. So bank 1 was allowed and bank 2 was denied. So if I again log in with bank 1, and the password is my first address view kyc customer 1 so here it is the bank 1 is able to see the details now if i log in as bank 2 and give password and try to see the it is saying permission denied so let's ask bank 2 to again request now bank 2 is now again requesting and now this time it allows now bank 2 can see the details. So all these transactions in the back end are happening on the blockchain network which is interfacing with the contract through its subsequent methods. Now the primary details of the contract are in the contract details or javascript where we have to provide the address at which the contract was deployed the abi file the abi so you can get the abi at here this is the abi and you can paste it here and this is the binary data which has to be pasted over here so the binary data can be fetched from remix this is the binary data for the contract it has to be copied and pasted over here now with these essential inputs provided our application allows us to interact in a decentralized fashion to access the kyc records of a particular customer now we can modify the details also and we can add a new customer again. So this is a basic demo of how a typical KYC application works in a banking environment. Blockchain tutorial part 2. So let's get started today and let's see what's in store for us.
so hey thanks for coming back to explain how blockchain work so in our last session just let's do a re quick recap what we have learned so let's look down the memory lane and discover what we had learned we learned about what blockchain is so a blockchain is a list of records which stores data publicly in a chronological order it applies security using cryptography it is not controlled by a centralized authority any information on a blockchain network is accessible to anyone on the network and as it is a distributed ledger it's a shared ledger everyone has the copy of the data so these are the primary attributes of a blockchain also you learned about bitcoin and how it works just to do a quick recap it was introduced in 2009 by someone or a group of pseudonymous people known as satoshi nakamoto it aimed to solve the problems faced by fiat currencies with the help of blockchain technology so the objective was to introduce a new asset class of cryptocurrencies which can be used in day to day transactions now as of in 2018 there are more than 1600 cryptocurrencies that follow the concept of bitcoin and blockchain and are very popular in our day to day lives now let's talk about the features of blockchain is a public distributed ledger it uses a hashing encryption to encrypt all the information on the blockchain it uses proof of work consensus algorithm for a consensus mechanism and it works with a concept of mining in order to reward the miners for keeping them and maintaining the sanity of the network and finally about how you can implement blockchain in a banking system so we talked about how to implement a kyc based blockchain decentralized app and how it allows you to create a decentralized banking system where a kyc done by a one bank can be leveraged by another bank and the customer does not have to go through multiple kyc iterations with each and every bank whom he or she wants to transact with now we will get a little deeper into blockchain and today we will talk about these topics we will talk about what is a candidate block we will talk about byzantine fault tolerance which was one of the earlier consensus mechanisms then we will talk about the problem of if we have to add two blocks at the same time then how does blockchain handles that then we will talk about the concept of forking what are soft forks what are hard forks and other areas where blockchain is getting used what is the future of blockchain and what are the upcoming blockchain jobs and the profiles which are upcoming in the market and then in the end we will do a quick demo on how to create a smart contract and deploy it for a particular use case now before a block can be mined a miner has to make a very important decision which transactions would be added to his block so before transactions are added to the blockchain they are collected in a temporary container called a memory pool the miners select transactions from this pool and they put it in a temporary block called candidate block so basically the candidate block is a temporary block which a miner hopes to add to a blockchain it's a candidate to be added to a blockchain so the candidate block holds transactions that the miner selects from the memory pool the miner then tries to be the first person to find the nonce value that satisfy the hash requirements now the question comes if someone in a blockchain wanted to input the wrong data by spreading wrong information around would he or she be able to get away with it and that's why we had something known as byzantine fault tolerance so in order to maintain the sanity of the network and to have the correct consensus there was something called as byzantine fault tolerance consensus algorithm to understand this you need to know what the byzantine general's problem is so let's imagine a byzantine general and three other lieutenants need to take over this town however they are at different places and can't directly communicate with each other so here we have the general and his three lieutenants the general has to ensure that all lieutenants follow the same order he or she gives them to attack or to retreat now this has to be ensured even if one of the lieutenants is a traitor so this is the byzantine general's problem that how does the general communicate the correct decision which he has taken to all his lieutenants in his network irrespective if someone is a traitor in this case a traitor could ruin the unity of the group by sending different messages to different lieutenants now here we can see that general is giving all his lieutenants the command to attack 
the traitor could ruin this by sending every other left hand in the command to retreat the opposite now in this situation the traitor would make others believe that the general asked them to retreat so as we can see the lieutenant in brown is the traitor and he could communicate to other lieutenants the wrong information and make them act on his behalf as a traitor in themselves now this would cause the lieutenants to retreat and the general's attack to fail so how do we tackle this the only way an attack or a retreat will be successful is by having a majority supporting that particular action to achieve this the lieutenants keep a tally of the orders they receive so in this scenario the general sends the attack order to each of his lieutenants the lieutenants in turn collect the order they receive and pass it on to the lieutenant near to them so each lieutenant will pass this order to the nearest lieutenant the traitor also will do the same but sends the retreat order to the other lieutenant however this will not be successful because each lieutenant now has a majority of attack and minority of retreat so this shows that the majority of the lieutenants would follow the general's command and the attack will be successful the scenario i mentioned before is byzantine fault tolerance now the same situation can be encountered in blockchain as well the traitor would add invalid transactions into the blockchain the traitor would send the inconsistent information to other nodes in a blockchain this would affect the reliability of blockchain and network blockchain are able to achieve byzantine fault tolerance with the help of proof of work let's see how it is effective it is effective because the process of adding a block to a blockchain is a work intensive process which involves a hashing algorithm the process is very hard very computative because it is heavily reliant on value obtained from the existing blockchain to have any meaningful impact the hacker would have to take a lot of time resources producing sufficient proof of work interesting imagine if you and i were miners and we both add a block to the blockchain at the same time how do we handle such a situation so although this does not happen very often there is a way to decide whose block should be added to the blockchain in an ideal scenario you just need to be the first one to find the hash value you need to be the first miner to generate that hash value and win the block so adding two blocks at the same time the hash value of the block only needs to be within the predetermined limit if the generated hash value is less than the target then the value is accepted and the block is added to the blockchain but if it is greater than the target then the value is denied and the block is not added to the blockchain but in this case if two people have obtained a satisfactory hash value at the same time so miner 1 and miner 2 were able to find the hash which was less than the target then what will happen whether miners 1 block will get added to the blockchain or miners 2 block will get added to the blockchain now 50% of the network has accepted miners 1 block and suppose rest has accepted miners 2 block so half of the network continues to work considering miners 1 block to be the right block and the other half network continues to work considering miners 2 block to be the right block however only one miners blockchain can be allowed to remain we cannot have two blockchains running it will defeat the purpose now this is achieved by selecting the subchain to which miners have first added a block so suppose miner 3 adds a new block to miners 1 blockchain this block now added by miner 3 is verified by everyone in the network it is then accepted as the dominant blockchain and is used by everyone else in the network the other version of the blockchain the miner 2 is completely discarded and the entire network now accepts miner 1's blockchain and we have now a single blockchain existing now this situation is also called an accidental fork so i heard about a version of bitcoin called bitcoin cash what's the difference between them there are other kinds too like bitcoin gold and bitcoin private these are all outcomes of a fork So what is a fork a fork is said to have taken place when a blockchain diverges into two potential paths a fork happens when the users of a network cannot come to an agreement with regards to a network's transaction details and the new rules to validate those transactions 
So there are two types of forks which can exist. Either it can be a soft fork or it can be a hard fork. A soft fork occurs when a change in the software protocol makes new blocks added to the blockchain following the new rules but are backward compatible. But in order to have a soft fork, it requires a majority of the users to commit to that change to be successful. So a soft fork could have multiple uses. It could be for tighter rules, it could be for cosmetic changes, addition of new functions, but not affecting the structure. So consider the scenario where the accepted block size is to be reduced from 1 MB to 100 KB. So first of all, it has to be approved by a majority of the network. Now the old version will be running on 1 MB block size, but once approved, the new version will start working on a block size of 100 KB. So anything which is less than 100 KB will be approved and will be added to the new block. So over time, people following the older version of the blockchain would be forced to move to the new one since none of their transactions would go through. So basically people using the old blockchain, they will be using the 1 MB block size, their transactions will not succeed and they will be forced to use the 100 KB block. Now let's talk about hard fork. A hard fork involves a change in the software protocol so radical that it forces a new blockchain to be created altogether. So basically in a hard fork, there will be two versions. There will be one blockchain that hasn't upgraded and there will be a blockchain that has upgraded according to the new software protocols. Both these blockchains will be considered valid and legitimate. The new path would follow new updated rules while the other one keeps following the old path. So the old one will not be discarded and will remain into existence. Now Bitcoin performed a hard fork on 1st August 2017 which created Bitcoin Cash. So thereby both Bitcoin and Bitcoin Cash remain existent. Now Bitcoin Cash was different from regular Bitcoin because it increased the block size from 1 MB to 8 MB. So thereby it helped reducing the transaction cost significantly lesser than that of the original Bitcoin network. Now other than with Bitcoin, where else is blockchain used? The other areas are for preventing voter fraud. Blockchain helps in ensuring that there is only one vote per person, ensuring that the data is not being tampered with or any false alterations are done. It helps creating an immutable ledger to record the votes as tallied. So once a transaction or a vote is recorded, it cannot be modified. It is also used in quality assurance, ensuring the products are of highest quality, being able to identify problem areas easily. So where do you think blockchain is going to be used in the future? So blockchain is seeing wide range of adoption amongst organizations. As of now, only 1% of all organizations have begun using blockchain technologies. But this percentage is expected to increase in the next five years or so. Then there is a need for blockchain regulations. The rules and regulations surrounding blockchain are not very clear for organizations to be comfortable using it and move towards faster adoption. Also, there is a need for removing this negative speculations surrounding blockchain. Several industries fear that blockchain will disrupt their normal functioning and believe that the adoption of a blockchain system isn't worth the effort. And there is an increase in job opportunities for skilled personnel. So as the technology is maturing, there would be a huge requirement for individuals who can understand and implement the concepts of blockchain. So what options do people have for jobs involving blockchain at the moment? There are many job opportunities, but the two most famous ones are blockchain architect and blockchain developer. Blockchain developer is a profile which requires designing, implementing and supporting a distributed blockchain network, analyze user requirements, design technology around a certain business model to build and launch a blockchain network. Blockchain architect profile requires to design and architect blockchain industry solutions, creates blockchain networks leveraging blockchain technology platforms, produce high quality code based on project requirements, conceptualize, design and build blockchain frameworks and assets. So let's have a quick demo on how to deploy a rating smart contract and have decentralized application running on a local blockchain network. We will be using Truffle and Solidity to build this application. So 
so in order to build this application we should have installed truffle and ganache on our local system so this is a ganache client which is running on my local host it is running on port 8545 and network id 5778 whenever you run a ganache client it is preceded with 10 accounts and 100 ether balance now this is my movie rating app and in this app i am going to deploy a smart contract called rating.soul which is going to capture the ratings for a certain set of movies which i'll predefine and the users will be able to set the ratings on a blockchain network in a decentralized fashion and we will be able to see that in every transaction a block is getting generated in my ganache client so in my movie rating app under the rating folder i will run the command truff compile and it will compile my smart contract rating.soul now the next command which i have to run is truff migrate now at this instance the truff migrate command will deploy my smart contract on my ganache client so if you see there are four blocks which have been created and my contract was created in this transaction and this is the address of the contract at which my contract is deployed so I can go back to my command prompt and say truff console and check the address of my contract. So this is 0x695 which is this address. Now when I deployed my smart contract, I had given the entry of deployment in a file called deploycontract.js under rating migrations and in that I had given this entry. I had given the path to my rating solidity file and i had initialized my smart contract with three movies star wars avatar and inception and given some predefined gas now once these steps are done and i know the address at which my contract is deployed i will copy that and paste it in the file of ethereum setup.js which is lying under my rating app ui source folder and i'll just change this address now once this rating address is changed i have to go back to my movie rating app folder under app ui i have to give the command npm start now my application is up and running on localhost 3000 and as you see i am able to do the voting and at each rating level my block is going to increase block 6 inception block 7 and as and when my rating is increasing a block is getting added so this demonstrates the usage of truffle and ganache in order to build your decentralized app wow blockchain is amazing thanks for explaining these things to me i am glad i could help you thanks Saurabh. Now we have Rahul to help you guys understand cryptocurrencies. I am Rahul from Simply Learn and this is Cryptocurrency Explained. Since man evolved, currency has been a very important part of our lives. In the caveman era, they used the barter system. Now the barter system involves goods and services being exchanged among each other. So now we have a situation where a caveman is exchanging 7 apples and getting oranges in return. Now the barter system fell out of use because it had some glaring flaws. Now these flaws include having people's requirements coincide. For example, say you have 5 apples and your friend has 5 oranges. You want some of his oranges. Now until and unless your friend has a requirement for the apples that you own, he'll not be ready to make an exchange for it. There's no common measure of value. Now since there's no common measure in terms of which value of a commodity can be expressed, there's a problem when you have to decide how many apples you're ready to trade for one orange or a mango. Not all goods can be divided or subdivided. For example, you can't divide a live animal into different smaller units. The goods cannot be transported easily. Now unlike how modern currency fits in your wallet or your mobile phone, the goods that you own cannot be taken with you everywhere you go. After realizing that the barter system didn't work very well, currency went through a few iterations. In 110 BC, an official currency was minted. In 1250 AD, gold-plated florins was introduced and this was used across Europe. And from 1680 to 1980, paper currency gained widespread popularity and was used across the world. This is how modern currency as we know it came into existence. Modern currency included paper currency and coins, credit cards and digital wallets. For example, you have Apple Pay, Amazon Pay, 
Paytm, PayPal and so on. All of this was controlled by banks and governments. Now this means that there was a centralized regulatory authority that limited how paper currency and credit cards worked. Now imagine the scenario of doing an online transaction. Here you are thanking your friend for paying for your lunch and you are saying that you are sending the money to their account. Now this transaction takes place successfully but there are several ways where this could have gone wrong. There could have been a technical issue at the bank. For example, their systems could have been down, the machines weren't working properly and so on. That means there's a central point of failure which is the bank. The user's accounts could have gotten hacked. For example, there could have been a DDoS attack or identity theft and so on. Or the transfer limits for that account were exceeded. This is why the future of currency lies with cryptocurrency. Now imagine the transaction between two people in the future. One of them has the Bitcoin app and there's a notification asking whether they're sure they're ready to transfer 5 Bitcoins. If yes, processing takes place. Here we are authenticating the user's identity, checking whether they have the required balance to make that transaction and other things. Now after that's done, the payment is transferred and the payment is received. All of this happens in a matter of minutes and is as simple as that. This in turn removes all the problems of modern banking. There's no limits to the funds you can transfer, your accounts cannot be hacked and there's no central point of failure. Now, as of 2018, there's more than 1600 cryptocurrencies available. Now, there are some popular ones like Bitcoin, Litecoin, Ethereum and Zcash. And a new cryptocurrency crops up every single day. Now, considering how much growth they're having at the moment, there's a good chance there's plenty more to come in the upcoming years. So, what exactly is cryptocurrency? A cryptocurrency is a digital or virtual currency that is meant to be a medium of exchange. Now, cryptocurrency is quite similar to real world currency, just that it does not have any physical embodiment. It also uses cryptography to work the way it does. Now, some of the features of cryptocurrency are that there's a limit to how many units can exist. With Bitcoin, this limit exists at 21 million. Now, after this, no more Bitcoins will be produced. You can easily verify the transfer of funds. Now, the hashing algorithms that Bitcoin uses makes it very easy for users to determine whether a transaction is valid or not. They operate independent of a bank or a central authority. They work in a decentralized manner. Now, new units can be added only after certain conditions are met. For example, for Bitcoin, only after a block has been added to the blockchain will the miner be rewarded with Bitcoins. And this is the only way new Bitcoins can be generated. So what makes cryptocurrency so special? Firstly, there's little to no transaction costs. Now, if you use the digital wallet, you'll know that if you're transferring money from your wallet to your bank account, you'll lose some amount of money. You have 24-7 access to money. You can't just walk up to your bank at 3 a.m. in the morning and say that you want to withdraw some money. There's no limits on purchases and withdrawals. There's freedom for anyone to use. For example, if you're setting up an account in your bank, you need to do some amount of paperwork and documentation. With cryptocurrencies, all of that can be avoided. International transactions are faster. Now, why transfers take about half a day to transfer money from one place to another? But with cryptocurrencies, it only takes a matter of minutes or seconds. What's the crypto in cryptocurrencies? Crypto refers to cryptography. It's a method of using encryption and decryption to secure communication in the presence of third parties with ill intent. Now, this refers to third parties who want to steal your data or want to eavesdrop on your conversation. Cryptography uses computational algorithms like SHA-256, which is the hashing algorithm that Bitcoin uses, a public key, which is like a digital identity of the user, which he shares with everyone, and a private key, which is the digital signature of the user, which he keeps hidden. Now, let's talk about a normal Bitcoin transaction. First, you have the transaction details. Now, this details who you want to send it to and how much Bitcoins you want to send them. Then, it's passed through a hashing algorithm. For Bitcoin, we use the SHA-256 algorithm. The output that you obtain is passed through a signature algorithm with the user's private key. Now, this is used to uniquely identify the user. This output is then distributed across the network for people to verify. This is done by using the sender's public key. The people who verify the transaction to check whether it's valid or not are known as miners. Now, after this is done, the transaction and several others are added to the blockchain where it cannot be changed again. If the concepts of hashing seem a little difficult to you, I would suggest you click on the top right corner and watch the blockchain explain video so that you can understand better. Now the SHA-256 algorithm, like I told you earlier, looks something like this. Now seeing how complicated it looks, I'm sure it's safe to say that the encryption is very difficult to hack. Today we'll be focusing on two major cryptocurrencies, Bitcoin and Ether. Now Bitcoin is a digital currency that is decentralized and works on the blockchain technology. It uses a peer-to-peer -peer network to perform transactions. Let's talk about Ether. Ether is a currency that's accepted in the Ethereum network. Now, the Ethereum network uses blockchain technology to create an open source platform for building and deploying decentralized applications. Now, let's talk about the similarities between Bitcoin and Ether. They're the biggest and most valuable cryptocurrencies in the market right now. 
Both of them use blockchain technology, but there's nothing but a technology that involves transactions being added to a container called block and creating a chain of blocks in which data cannot be altered. Currency is mined using a method called proof of work, which is a form of mathematical puzzle that needs to be solved before a block can be added to the blockchain. Finally, these are widely used across the world. Now, let's talk about the differences. With Bitcoin, it is used to send money to someone. This is very similar to how real life currency works. With Ether, it is used as a currency within the Ethereum network, although it can be used for real life transactions as well. Bitcoin transactions are manual, which means you have to personally perform these transactions. With Ether, you have the option to make these transactions manual or automatic or programmable, which means that these transactions will take place when a certain condition has been met. For Bitcoin, it takes 10 minutes to perform a transaction, which is the amount of time it takes for a block to be added to the blockchain. With Ether, it takes about 20 seconds to do a transaction. Now, blockchain is used like money for real world transactions, and Ether is used to power the Ethereum network and power real life transactions as well. Ether is used as fuel within the Ethereum network to power both of these things. Now, there's a limit to how many Bitcoins can exist, which is 21 million. We're supposed to hit this number by the year 2140. Ether is expected to be around for a while, but not to exceed 100 million units. Now, Bitcoin is used for transactions involving goods and services, and Ether uses blockchain technology to create a ledger to trigger a transaction when a certain condition is met. For Bitcoin, we use an algorithm called SHA-256 for hashing, and with Ethereum, we use ETHash. As of July 23rd, 2018, one Bitcoin equals $7,668. For Ether, it costs $464. Now, what's the future of cryptocurrencies? The whole world is clearly divided when it comes to cryptocurrencies. On one side, you have supporters like Bill Gates, Al Gore, and Richard Branson who say that cryptocurrencies are better than regular currencies. On the other side, we have people completely against it. People like Warren Buffet, Paul Krugman, and Richard Schiller who are both Nobel Prize winners in the field of economics. They call it a Ponzi scheme and means for criminal activities. In the future, there's going to be a conflict between regulation and anonymity. Since several cryptocurrencies have been linked with terrorist attacks, governments would want to regulate how cryptocurrencies would work. Ethereum. So now let's take a look what's in it for all of us today. We will be talking about what is Ethereum, the features of Ethereum like cryptocurrency, smart contracts, Ethereum virtual machine, decentralized application and its uses, and decentralized autonomous organization. We'll be also looking at applications of Ethereum, and a demo on smart contract deployment on a locally running Ethereum client. Now, what is Ethereum? Ethereum is a blockchain based computing platform that enables developers to build and deploy decentralized applications. So basically, Ethereum is a platform where we can build applications which are not run by a centralized authority. You can create a decentralized application where the participants of that particular application are the decision making authority. So the, here we can see Ethereum allows us to to build and deploy DAP applications. Now, what are the typical features of Ethereum? Ethereum allows you to use its own cryptocurrency called ETH. It allows development and deployment of smart contracts. It provides you the underlying technology, the architecture, the software, which understands smart contracts and allow you to interact with it, which is called Ethereum virtual machine. Then it allows eventually to create consolidated applications called decentralized applications. And also it allows you to create decentralized autonomous organization. Now let's talk about Ethereum cryptocurrency. Ether ETH is a cryptocurrency that runs on Ethereum network. Basically, it is the fuel which is running the Ethereum network. It is used to pay for the computational resources and the transaction fees for any transaction to be executed on a Ethereum network. Like Bitcoin, Ether is also a peer-to-peer -peer currency. Apart from paying for transaction, Ether is also used to buy gas which is used to pay for computation of any transaction you make on a Ethereum network. Also, if you have to deploy a contract on Ethereum network, you would need gas and you would have to pay for that gas in Ethers. So gas is the execution fee paid by a user for running a transaction in Ethereum. Ether can be utilized for building decentralized applications, for building your smart contracts, and making standard peer-to-peer -peer payments. Now, what is a smart contract? 
A smart contract is a simple computer program that facilitates the exchange of any valuable asset between two parties. It could be money, it could be shares, it could be property or it could be any other digital asset which you want to exchange. These contracts can be created by anyone on the Ethereum network and primarily the contract consists of the terms and conditions mutually agreed between the parties, between the peers and the primary feature of a smart contract is that once it is executed it cannot be altered and any transaction action done on top of a smart contract is registered permanently it is immutable so even in future you modify the smart contract the transactions correlated with the original contract does not get altered or you cannot modify them so for the verification process smart contract is carried out amongst the anonymous parties of the network without the need of a centralized authority and that's what makes any smart contract execution on ethereum a d decentralized execution it provides the transfer of any asset or currency in a transparent and a trustworthy manner as the two entities are totally unaware their identity is secure on the ethereum network though the transactions once successfully done the accounts of the sender and receiver are updated accordingly and that's why it generates a trust between the parties who are transacting using the ethereum network now what happens in traditional system of contract in traditional systems of contract you sign an agreement then you trust a third party hire a third party for execution now the problem is that in such an engagement the data tampering is possible now if we talk about the new smart contract the agreement is coded in a program now result is not verified by a centralized authority it is verified by the participants on ethereum based blockchain network now once a contract is executed the transaction is registered and it cannot be altered or tampered so it removes the risk of any data manipulation or alteration now let's take another example where jack has given a contract of 500 dollars to elsa for developing his company his website now the developers code the agreement of smart contract using ethereum's programming language now the smart contract has all the conditions the requirements for building the website once the code is written it is uploaded and deployed on the ethereum evm virtual machine evm is a runtime compiler to execute your smart contract once the code is deployed on the evm every participant on the network has a copy of the contract now now when else the submits the work on ethereum for evaluation each node on the ethereum network will evaluate and confirm whether the result given by elsa is done as per the coding requirements and once approved and verified the contract worth 500 dollars will be self executed and the payment will be paid to elsa in ethers so john's account the person who had gone into a contract his account will be automatically debited and elsa will be credited with 500 dollars in ether denomination here we will now take a look we will do a demo small demo on a deployment of a smart contract so for in order to execute our smart contract we will need two set of softwares ganache and truffle and we will show you in the demo how to install these two softwares on your machine now we will be giving a demo on the following smart contract this is a smart contract where we are writing a simple contract of a greeter we have a variable called greeting which we will be initializing using a constructor and then in our demo we will be showing how you can change the value of the variable greeting using the set greeting method and read the value using the greet method this is the other contract where we will be defining that whoever is deploying the contract on the blockchain network is always the owner of the contract and then we have defined certain mandatory functions in order to kill the contract on the ethereum network so only the owner of the contract can kill it now let's talk about what is an ethereum virtual machine ethereum virtual machine is designed to operate as a runtime environment for compiling and deploying ethereum based smart contracts basically evm is the engine which understands the language of smart contracts which are written in solidity language for ethereum evm is operated in a sandbox environment basically you can deploy your own standalone environment which can act as a testing and a development environment and you can n number of times test your smart contract deploy it verify it and then once you are satisfied 
satisfied with the performance and the functionality of the smart contract, you can deploy it on the Ethereum mainnet. Now, any programming language in the smart contract is compiled into the bytecode which the EVM understands. This bytecode can be read and executed using an Ethereum feature called Ethereum Virtual Machine. So basically, EVM machine understands the bytecode. So one of the most popular languages for writing a smart contract is Solidity. So once you write your smart contract on Solidity, that contract gets converted into the bytecode and gets deployed on the EVM. And thereby, EVM guarantees security from cyber attack. Now, how does EVM work? So suppose A wants to pay B 10 ethers. The transaction will be sent to the EVM using a smart contract for a funds transfer from A to B. Now in order to validate the transaction, the Ethereum network will perform the proof of work consensus algorithm. The minor nodes on the Ethereum will validate this transaction. Whether the first the identity of A exists or not, A has the relevant amount of balance to transfer 10 ether to B and in will validate the transaction. Once validated, the Ether will be debited from A's wallet and will be credited to B's wallet. And during this course, the miners will charge a fees in order to validate this transaction and will earn a reward. Now, all the nodes on Ethereum network execute smart contract using their respective EVMs. Now, how does proof of work work? Every node in the Ethereum network has the entire history of all the transactions the entire chain it has the history of smart contract basically the address at which the smart contract is deployed the transactions associated with the smart contract and also it has the handle to the current state of the smart contract now the goal of the miners on the ethereum blockchain network is to validate the block for each block of transaction, miners use the computational power and resources to get the appropriate hash value by varying the nonce. Now the miners will vary the nonce and pass it through a hashing algorithm. In case of Ethereum, it is the it hash algorithm. This produces a hash value which should be lesser than the predefined target as per the proof of work consensus. If the hash value generated is less than the target value, then only the block is considered to be verified and the miner gets rewarded only then. Now when the proof of work is solved, result is broadcasted and shared with all the other nodes in order to update their ledger. If other nodes accept the hash block as valid, then the block gets added to the Ethereum mainnet blockchain. And as a result, the miner receives a reward which as of today stands at 3 Ether plus the miner receives the transaction fees which has been generated for verifying the block. All the transactions which are aggregated in the block, the cumulative transaction fees associated with all the transactions is also rewarded to the miner. Now do you know in Ethereum, a process called proof of stake is also under development and it is an alternative to proof of work. It is meant to be a solution to minimize the use of expensive resources spent for mining using proof of work. Now in proof of stake, uh, the miner is actually the validator can validate the transactions based on the amount of crypto coins he or she holds before he or she can start the mining. So based on the accumulation or the repository of crypto coins with the miner beforehand will give him the higher probability of mining the block. Now however, proof of stake is not widely adopted as of now as compared to proof of work algorithm. Now let's understand the concept of gas. Now Ethereum virtual machine has a concept of gas and why do we need it? So like we need fuel to run car in the same way in order to run application on Ethereum network we need gas. Now what is gas? To perform any transaction in Ethereum network a user has to make a payment, has to shell out ethers in order to get the execution done, the transaction action done and the intermediary monetary value is called as gas. On Ethereum network, gas is a unit that measures the computational power required to run a smart contract or a transaction. So if you have to do a transaction which is updating the blockchain, you would have to shell out gas and that gas will come with a price in ethers. Now how is the gas fees calculated? In Ethereum, the transaction fees is calculated in Ethereum using the below formula. For every transaction, there is a gas and the correlated gas price. So the amount of gas required to execute a transaction multiplied by the gas price 
you generate the transaction fees. So gas limit on Ethereum network refers to the amount of gas which is used for the computation and the amount of Ether a user is required to pay for the gas. Now here we have a screenshot from the Ethereum mainnet where the cost of transaction is being shown. So if you see for this particular example transaction, the gas limit was 21,000. The gas used by the transaction was 21,000 and the gas price was 21 GUI which is the lowest denomination. So 21 GUI into 21,000 gave you the actual transaction fees which is 0.00441 Ether which is approximately 0.21 cents as of today's Ether market value. Now this transaction fee goes to the miner who has validated the transaction. To understand the gas limit and the gas price in a better way, let's consider an example of a car. Suppose your car has a mileage of 10 kilometers and the price of petrol is $1 per liter, then driving a car for 50 kilometers will cost you 5 liters of petrol which will be worth $5. Similarly, to perform an operation or to run a code on Ethereum, you need to spend certain amount of gas like the petrol where each gas has a per unit price called gas price. Now, if a user provides less amount of gas to run a particular operation, then the process will fail and the user will be given a message of out of gas. And GUI is the lowest denomination of Ether which is used for measuring unit of a gas price. Now, how is Ethereum's mining different from Bitcoin mining? The hashing algorithm is the primary difference. The Bitcoin uses SHA-256, Ethereum uses ITHash. The average time taken on Bitcoin for mining a block is 10 minutes whereas in ethereum it is 12 to 15 seconds as of today the mining reward for bitcoin is 12.5 btc but for ethereum it is three ethers plus the transaction fee the accumulated transaction fee for all the transactions for a block now as of 23rd july the bitcoin value was 7667 dollars whereas one ether stands at 466 dollars now here we have a screenshot of an ethereum reward which has been given Given to the miner of the block. Now, as you can see, here is the breakup of the reward: three ethers plus the total accumulated transaction fee of all the underlying transactions in this block, which is 0 0.0666 ethers. Now what is a decentralized application now let's compare it with our traditional applications our traditional websites which are currently running so for example when you log into twitter a web application gets displayed which is rendered using an html page now the page will call an api to access your personal data your information which is centrally hosted now it's a simple process your front end executes a back end api and the api goes and fetches the information from a centralized db now if we transform this application application into a decentralized application then now when you will log in the same web application will get rendered but it will be calling a smart contract based api to fetch the information from the blockchain network so the api gets replaced with the smart contract interface and the smart contract will fetch the information from the blockchain network which is its backend and that blockchain network is not a centralized db it's a decentralized network where the participants of the network the miners of the network are validating verifying all the transactions which are happening using the smart contract on the blockchain network so thereby any now any transaction or any action happening on the twitter kind of application which has been transformed will now cannot be claimed as a centralized uh, transaction it will be a decentralized transaction a dap a decentralized application consists of backend code that runs on a distributed peer-to-peer -peer network it is a software designed to work on an ethereum network without being controlled by a centralized system and that is the primary difference it provides the direct interaction between the end users and the decentralized application providers now an application qualifies as dap when it is open sourced its code is there on github and it uses a public blockchain based token in order to run the application a token acts as a fuel for the decentralized application to run dap allows the backend code and data to be decentralized and that is the primary architecture of any dap now let's discuss what are decentralized autonomous organizations DAOs is a digital organization that wants to operate without any need of a hierarchical management it wants to operate in a decentralized and a democratized fashion 
so basically a dao is an organization where the decision making should not be in the hands of a centralized authority but it should be in the hands of certain designated authorities or a group of designated people as a part of authority it exists on a blockchain network where it is governed by the protocols embedded in a smart contract and thereby they rely on a smart contract for decision making all the business decisions are driven by the smart contracts or we can say a decentralized voting system within the organization so any de organizational decision before being taken has to go through the voting system which is running on a decentralized application so how it work people add funds to the dao because dao requires funding in order to execute and take decisions based on that each member is given a token on a percentage basis which represents the percentage of shares of that particular member in the dao now those tokens are used to vote in the dao where the proposal status is decided based on the maximum votes so every decision within the organization has to go through this voting process now let's take a look what are the applications of ethereum in real world and where it is getting used so as we have seen with dao voting system are adopting it the results of the polls are publicly available where it ensures a transparent and fair democracy by eliminating voting malpractices it is getting adopted widely in a banking scenarios and banking systems with ethereum's decentralized system it is becoming very difficult for hackers to have unauthorized access and it also allows payments on a ethereum based network so banks are also using ethereum as a channel to make remittances and payments shipping deploying ethereum in shipping helps tracking of cargo and prevents goods from being misplaced or counterfeited so basically ethereum is providing you of the provenance and tracking framework for any kind of asset required in a typical supply chain now with ethereum's smart contract agreements can be maintained and executed without any alteration so any industry which has fragmented participants is subject to disputes and uh, which requires an digital contracts to be present then ethereum can definitely be used as a technology for developing your smart contract and digitally recording the agreements and the transactions based on those agreements so let's get started for a demo on how to deploy an ethereum smart contract locally so in order to deploy a smart contract we will be first installing ganash client which allows you to host a local ethereum client on which you can deploy your smart contract so as we are working on the windows environment when we are downloading the ganash setup we can also download node in order to install truffle on our machines Now as the node has been downloaded we will install node So now node is successfully installed now we are going to install ganash locally now we will run ganash a little later before that we will perform certain steps or we can run ganash and see so once ganash is up and running i'll show you the interface how it looks so when ganash is brought up it automatically creates 10 accounts with prefunded balance of 100 ethers it is running on local host port number 7545 now as you see there is no transaction or anything which has currently happened so the current block is zero which is the genesis block there are no transactions and there are no blocks as of now so there are no transactions in block which have been generated so using this ganash client now we will be deploying our greeter contract now as we have installed node we will be installing truffle truffle is the utility which allows us to compile and deploy ethereum contracts okay now once truffle is installed we need to create a directory called greeter now we need to run the command 
truffle. Now, once we run this command, truffle by default creates a package structure which has three folders called contracts, migrations, test, truffle.js, and truffle config. Now, we will be writing our smart contract called greeter.soul and we will compile and deploy. Basically, our greeter.soul will be under contracts folder and we can our contract is created and it is lying under contracts folder now we need to add another file under migrations folder called as deploy contract.js so we will name it as deploy contract now in this deploy contract we need to put line of code. Now in this file, we are asking Truffle to deploy our newly created greeter.soul file. Now in the greeter contract, we have a constructor. We are initializing the greeter contract with a value high hello and we are passing a gas value. So this gas is currently at a higher limit and we know that this gas value the contract will get executed. But otherwise, you can also evaluate the gas value of a contract using Remix. Now, once this file is being saved, you go to the truffle.js and make the following entry. Now, here we are telling Truffle that our localhost Ganache client is running on localhost at port number 7545 and network ID can be anything though the current Ganache client is running on port network ID 5777 but we have kept it open that we can connect to any network ID. Now after this step I need to go back to my command prompt and say truffle compile. Now if you get this error if we are getting this kind of error in windows then we need to do one quick fix. We need to go to the users directory and rename truffle.cmd to truff. So I'll go to my C drive users update homing him just now here now instead of truffle I have to say truff. Now there might be certain compilation warnings we can ignore that. Now my contract is being compiled. Now I need to run the next command truff migrate. At this stage, my smart contract is deployed and now you can see this is the step. This is the place where the contract has been called and this is the transaction where the default value of my variable greeter has been set to hi hello. So we will see now I need to run command truff console to interact with my contract. Now as on my truff console, I can check at what address is my contract deployed. So my contract is deployed at address 0x37 which matches with the address 0x373. Now I need to check the default value which I had set while deploying my contract. So this is my value hi hello. Now I can change the value to something else because in my greeter contract I have a method called set greeting. Now whenever when I will be performing this action a new block will get generated and the block count will increase from 4 to 5 because I am making a change on the blockchain. As you can see now a new transaction has been created. This was the gas used. This is the default gas price in Ganache. And Block number 5 is being mined. Now I can reread the value of the variable. Now it will return me the latest value, which is change greet value. So this demonstrates how to use a Solidity contract, how to compile it, deploy it on a locally running blockchain network. You can connect multiple nodes to this Ganache client and all the nodes should be running on the same network ID, should have the same network ID but they can be running on a different machine. So here we can see all the other details, the block, the transactions which have happened, 
if I perform the action again, block number six has been generated, has another transaction associated with it, and I can get the latest value. So let's get started and understand what is a smart contract. What's in it for us today? Let's understand why do we need a smart contract? What is a smart contract? Usage of solidity for building smart contract, advantages of smart contract, blockchain implementation of smart contracts. We'll look at certain examples of voting and digital token. And also we will take another use case of how smart contract help us do crowdfunding. Now, why smart contract? Now, let's take a look traditionally how contracts used to happen. If suppose two parties, A and B, have to get into a contract, they will utilize the services of a third party whom they have to trust and get the contract executed. Now, with the introduction of smart contracts and the technology which is evolving, removes the dependency on such third parties and automates the execution of such smart contracts. So, if we compare traditional versus the new smart contract in traditional we used to have governments lawyers or any other third party on which we can trust in smart contracts we don't need any third party we don't need any intermediate execution time definitely there's higher execution time in traditional contracts because as many number of middlemen and their intermediary layers that many number of days and time it takes smart contract is just a matter of minutes it gets executed because it is automated programmable running on a computer and it has has some predefined condition remittance if any remittance of either of the parties have to happen then it's a manual process approvals workflows processes and these manual processes take time under traditional contracting system but in a smart contract as the conditions are predefined pre-embedded as soon as a condition is met the remittance happens automatically either of the parties who have to be credited with an amount is credited automatically and that is the primary advantage of using a smart contract transparency is not available 100% in traditional contracts. The transparency is bound, peripheral between the parties and the entities and the intermediaries involved. As compared to smart contract, transparency is 100% available 24 by 7 online. Anyone can go and review, audit and validate the transactions executed by the smart contracts. Archiving. Archiving is a big difficult problem for traditional contracts as most of the transactions are paper based or the records are maintained offline. It becomes very difficult to maintain and identify the traceability provenance of all the transactions which have happened in a traditional contract whereby in a smart contract it becomes easy as all the transactions have happened through the smart contract. There's a hundred percent traceability available from the provenance point of view. You can trace the transaction from its day one the point of origin till present day and archiving is automatically happening the log the audit the transaction history is automatically getting generated security definitely is a concern in traditional contracts as the intermediaries and involved manual processes and involved security can be compromised at any level at any stage but in a smart contract the security is maintained through cryptography mainly through public key infrastructure the public and private key infrastructure it is a very secure way of maintaining security and cryptography of the transactions using a smart contract cost yes traditional contracts are expensive the cost of transaction is high as compared to smart contracts as the middlemen are involved smart contract the cost is low as we don't have any intermediaries and only the cost of transaction is charged by the underlying infrastructure of the blockchain network which is running the smart contract signatures it's a manual process all the transactions are signed manually and very manually but here in the smart contracts all the transactions are digitally signed using the private key of the entities and can only be decoded by the public key shared by the parties involved in the smart contract so in a nutshell smart contracts give us n number of advantages the primary advantages are listed here and these are the advantages which enforce us to move towards an economy and to a system where we start using smart contracts for our transactions to avoid any disputes to keep the transaction cost low thereby giving the advantage to the end consumer now what is a smart contract let's consider a real life example where you are taking out a chocolate from a vending machine you deposit a two dollar note in a vending machine after that you hit a1 button which is mapped against the chocolate bar that you want to buy as a result a lever in the vending machine moves and pushes out the chocolate so basically a1 button is programmed to the lever in order to move the chocolate out now a smart contract is very similar to 
a vending machine it eliminates the need of an intermediary in case of the vending machine is replacing a direct seller and allowing you to make a purchase without a middleman and it eliminates the need of escrow services now smart contracts are self executing contracts which contain the terms and conditions of an agreement between the parties and the peers who are involved in that agreement so the terms and conditions of an agreement are written in a piece of code and it is executed on a blockchain based decentralized platform now these agreements facilitates exchange of any digital asset it could be digital currency it could be shares it could be property or it could be anything which you want to transact so a blockchain based decentralized platform gives you a democratic system where the transactions are authorized by the majority of the participants and the identity of the participants is also kept anonymous now let's consider an example where rachel is at the airport and her flight is delayed but this inconvenience could have been beneficial to rachel as smart contract insurance would ensure she is given a compensation for the flight's delay instantly so just imagine there is a smart contract which the insurance company has already deployed and it's monitoring the flight's delay rachel has already taken that insurance for delay in flights so as soon as that condition is met for a delay of flight above x amount of hours for example 2 hours then in that case the insurance company will automatically get that trigger and rachel will be credited with that amount for which she is insured in her account so let's see how smart contract can be helpful here so axa flight delay insurance is one of the examples of ethereum smart contract axa is an insurance company the smart contract is linked to the databases that record flight status so that smart contract is connected to the databases it is fetching that information and evaluating the delay it enables automatic compensation when there is a delay for 2 hours or more so that is the condition when the flight delay is beyond 2 hours then the insurance contract will get executed and rachel will get paid so a smart contract is created based on the terms and conditions so condition compensation is equal to flight delay is less than 2 hours based on the code smart contract holds the company's money until a certain condition is satisfied this smart contract is submitted to the nodes on the blockchain network to their evms for evaluation so evm is a runtime compiler to execute smart contracts code it is the brain it is the electronic virtual machine which executes the smart contract all nodes on the network executing the code using the evm must come to the same result because all the evms would have the same copy of the smart contract deployed so if the flight is delayed two or more hours smart contract will be self executed and the compensation amount will be given to rachel and that is the objective of the smart contract without involvement of any middleman paperwork which rachel has to do to submit and then the insurance company going through the manual process all that has been bypassed and rachel has been compensated directly now let's understand why do we need solidity for developing our smart contracts now here comes the important question which programming language does a smart contract use there are two widely used programming languages for writing ethereum smart contracts solidity and serpent however on blockchain platform solidity is widely used for implementing smart contracts and this is what we were going to talk about in our subsequent slides now solidity is a high level programming language used for implementing smart contracts it enables to check the program at runtime rather than compile time solidity is a turing complete language it has all the conditions all the while loops for loop operators etc which are there in any mature programming language in order to write your code in order to write your conditions if you have certain loop if you have while conditions etc now what are the advantages of smart contract as we have already discussed there are no intermediaries involved the process executes without the need of a third party it's an automated process they are automated with the code which eliminates manual effort for execution it's a high speed highly computive smart contracts which runs on programming code the speed of its execution is higher than a traditional contract as the data is stored in the decentralized system the chances of modifying the data is difficult and i would say more than impossible accuracy based on the requirement terms and condition of a contract is recorded accurately so as soon as any transaction is recorded it is registered on a blockchain network and it is immutable transaction no one can modify 
modify or make changes in any record which has been added onto a blockchain network through a smart contract. Now let's take a look at certain blockchain implementation of a smart contract. Using blockchain in voting process can eliminate voting malpractices. A centralized voting system faces a lot of problems when it comes to tracking votes. There could be manipulated identities, there could be manipulation in counting, and there could be biased decision making. A smart contract is introduced to eliminate all these malpractices. There are certain predefined terms and conditions which are already set in the contract. No no voter can vote from a digital identity of any other voter. The counting is foolproof. Every vote is registered on a blockchain network and the counting is happening automatically without any interference from a third party or dependency on a manual process. So terms and condition, each ID should be attributed to just one vote. The validation is done by the users on the blockchain network itself. So the voting process can be in a public blockchain or, or it could be in a decentralized autonomous organization based blockchain setup also but it is 100% transparent and every voting transaction is recorded result every voters vote get recorded on the ledger and that information cannot be modified it is transparently publicly available for audit and verification now let's take a look at one of the examples of our voting solidity contract so here we have our voting solidity contract it is built in solidity and i'll just give you a brief overview of what are the prime primary functions in this so if we look at this particular contract this contract gives you certain basic parameters like what should be the minimum number of participants or proposals which are required for voting then what should be the minimum amount of time for debate that needs to pass before the vote can be executed then the margin of votes for majority a proposal passes if there are more than 50 percent of the votes plus the margin so basically we are defining what is the winning condition what is the majority margin for any vote to be accepted then you have data structure where you are accepting the proposals right and then subsequently we are defining data structures for members who are participating in the proposals who are submitting the proposals we are fetching the addresses of the members basically this is the digital identity of the members who are submitting the proposals and etc so this smart contracts basically allows you to create a voting system where you can add members we can remove the members you can change certain certain voting rules based on certain conditions like if you want to increase the minimum quorum if you want to change the debating period minutes or the majority rule changes then this is the function for submitting a new proposal for which the voting has to happen so basically this example is about if i have to take a vote within a decentralized autonomous organization for a particular decision so rather than a central authority taking a decision you can have a voting mechanism within your organization to give a majority to your proposal if you get the majority the proposal is accepted otherwise reject then there are peripheral functions like check proposal code then there is a voting function the actual vote happens and for a particular proposal you start increasing or decreasing the number of votes then you execute the proposal if the majority has been achieved now let's take a look on how to deploy a smart contract so here we have our voting smart contract now we will take a look on how to deploy our voting smart contract on the ethereum test network called robston this is our voting smart contract now when you open remix you should also have metamask which is a chrome plugin installed this is a utility in order to connect to the robston testnet which is a ethereum test network so basically you say robston.etherscan.io and this is the ethereum test network on which we will deploy our contract so once you log in into the metamask you will have a account created and in that account you should have some test ethers already so that you can use them to deploy your contract so when you create an account on uh, robston you can buy certain ethers using the robston test faucet so when you reach this site the robston test faucet has already taken the address for the account for which you are raising the request and you can raise request of one ether now whenever this transaction will get processed your account balance will get incremented by one ether. so as i already have ethers in it i can utilize it to deploy my contract now in order to compile and deploy my contract I have copy pasted it here and if I go to my run my remix has already communicated via injected web 3 to the metamask and 
take in my account which has 7.83 ether now i need to do some settings Now, as my contract is compiled, you can see it has taken all the contracts. You can see the drop down, and Congress is my major contract. Now, I will deploy my contract. So, on the run section, you will be able to see in the drop down the name of the contracts which are there in my smart contract. Like I had owned token recipient, then there's an interface, and there is a Congress. So, I need to deploy my Congress contract. Now, in order to deploy this contract, there is a constructor which requires certain inputs so i can give certain values like what minimum number of proposals i need 100 then minimum number of debates 10 and margin of votes for majority so i say deploy now as soon as i'll click deploy it is going to request me for gas because when the contract gets deployed it will deduct certain ethers from my account so when i'll say submit if you notice now this transaction has got initiated on the robston etherscan.io i click on it so this is the transaction on which the contract is getting deployed it is taking time and the contract is getting processed on the ethereum network now once it will get deployed we will be able to see the address at which the contract has got created and deployed now as you can see my contract has got deployed at the address 0xcc i can load it now this is the contract address and this is the amount of actual ether which was spent from my account in order to deploy the contract. Now there are certain attributes on the option ether scan which you can go and check. You can verify and publish your smart contract over here so that others can also view the code and utilize your smart contract. And if you go and check your MetaMask, this is the transaction which has just been done in your account. And if you click, it will take you to the same transaction which we opened here. Now, after you have deployed the contract, you can interact with your contract directly through Remix just to test your contract. All the pink members are the ones which make changes onto the blockchain and all the blue ones are the ones which are only performing read operations so in order to do any read operation you will not be requested to spend any gas so there will be no pop-ups for metamask requesting for gas spending but if you do any of these pink actions then you will be required to spend gas as it will be requiring to make some changes onto the blockchain so this was a example of a voting smart contract and this will be available as a link for you to take a look now all our other contracts which we will be covering subsequently will be deployed in a similar fashion on the robston testnet now let's take another example if you want to use smart contract to issue your own cryptocurrency or called digital token you can use ethereum based smart contract to create your own digital tokens for performing transactions a design and issue your own digital currency create a tradable computerized token that can be utilized as a currency share or any asset which you want to transact these tokens use a standard coin api like in case of ethereum we have standardizations of erc20 etc which allows contract to automatically access any wallet for exchange as a result you build a tradable token with a fixed supply and this particular platform becomes a, like a central bank issuing a digital money your smart contract becomes the bank issuing the money so let's take this example here so this is a implementation of a erc20 token which is a specification by ethereum and uh, the primary attribute for this token is that you need to provide a name of your token a symbol the decimals to which you support and the most primary is the predefined supply so just like in an economy you have limited supply of money here also you have to define what will be the supply of your tokens and it will be capped that will be the supply so you need to predefine these parameters and then you create certain data structures within solidity to keep a tap on the balances of 
the entities to which you are giving the tokens and how much allowance you want to keep per address then there are certain method which you have to implement as per the erc20 specification like transfer transfer from approve and call etc so all these methods in a typical token allows you to do the transaction send and receive your custom token among multiple parties so this would also be available as a link for you to take a look now let's take another example example of a use case for crowdfunding using smart contracts to crowdfund your project so suppose you want to start a business and for a business you need a lot of funding which is required but who would lend that money to someone whom they don't trust how will you generate that money for such problems smart contract plays a major role with ethereum you can build a smart contract that will hold a contributor's funds unless a given date or a goal is met based on the result the funds will be released to the contract owners or will be sent back to the contributors so basically you can create a crowdfunding project for yourself if you want to raise certain amount of money and the contributors or the investors will give you the money but the amount will be kept on hold till the time your project goal or date has been met and accordingly the investor will get your the token which you have developed for crowdfunding in hers or his account accordingly now centralized crowdfunding system has plenty of issues with management systems so therefore a dao a decentralized autonomous organization is utilized for crowdfunding the terms and conditions are transparently set in the contract every individual participating in the crowdfunding is given a token and the token is credited to their ethereum based account now every contribution gets recorded on the blockchain because when the token transfer has happened from the dao to the individual investor that transaction get recorded on the blockchain network so let's uh, quickly take a look at the uh, contract for a crowd sale also so a crowd sale contract provides you the basic attributes like what is the goal of the funding how much money you need to raise what is the amount raised real time you can keep a track what is the deadline right and what is the price of the token in ethereum basically what is the your token amount in ethereum then there could be that you might give certain tokens in reward then you can have attributes for your reward and then you have your methods in order to keep a check that once you have received the funds you can withdraw the funds you can check whether you have reached the goal for funding and then you have the methods for transferring tokens from the sender to your own account this particular kind of contract allows you to maintain and keep a check on amount of funding you have received or you want to receive have you achieved your target who are the investors in your token how much percentage share belongs to your account and how much percentage share has been already been distributed all amongst the investors etc so everything can be tracked so the smart contract can build in such a fashion that there are methods and utilities available in order to run your entire crowdfunding so this contract is also available in the link and you can take a look now that that's done saurav will teach us about bitcoin mining and how bitcoin wallets work so let's get started and let's talk about what is bitcoin mining so what is bitcoin so let's take an example so there is someone who wants to send 5 bitcoins to rachel now we will see how this transaction can happen now bitcoin is based on the concept of digital currency anyone across the globe can transfer amount in bitcoin irrespective of the geography from anyone to anyone so basically you need to just open an account on the bitcoin network have some bitcoins in it and you can transfer it either you can purchase the bitcoins online through some uh, exchanges or you can mine it so once you have bitcoins in your account you can transfer it to someone you want whose address you have now do you want to know how this transaction work well this transaction is done by bitcoin mining so we will go deep and understand that how the bitcoin transaction works what all entities are involved behind the scenes in order to maintain the sanity of the bitcoin network and make sure that whomever you wanted the bitcoin to reach to has reached and there is no loss of bitcoin in the network and it is a successful transaction so let's understand certain basics so what in it for us today we need to know what is bitcoin we will understand the underlying technology blockchain so we will talk about that then we will see what are the advantages of bitcoin 
as compared to other digital currencies and other digital technologies then we will go into the concepts of bitcoin mining then what is bitcoin mining and we will do a demo on certain aspects of bitcoin mining now what is bitcoin bitcoin is the first decentralized digital currency that allows users to transfer money peer to peer without any intermediaries like banks governments agents brokers nothing is involved and all this is done using blockchain technology so as we saw in our previous example two parties wants to exchange money transfer money they don't need an intermediary now bitcoin can be used for online purchases e-commerce transactions it can be used as an investment instrument and it can be primarily used for payments to buy goods and services now it was created in 2009 it came into existence by a person or a group of people called satoshi nakamoto now bitcoin helps transferring of assets faster than regular fiat currencies it has definitely lower transaction fees because as it has removed the intermediaries from between the cost of transaction also goes down and it is cryptographically secure it uses cryptography infrastructure and thereby the identities of the sender and the receiver are also secure and the entire transaction is cryptographically signed and the users information who are doing the transactions or are part of the network is also hidden and secure now what are the advantages of bitcoin so it allows fast and quick peer to peer transactions it is impossible to counterfeit or hack the transactions which are running on a bitcoin network and it's an overall decentralized process there is no centralized body which is controlling the transactions or charging a fees in order to validate the transaction it is the participants in the decentralized network who are taking care of the sanity of the network thereby making sure that the overall transaction cost is low all the information is accessible to public it is available publicly on a public ledger anyone can go and view the transactions and the volume of the transactions happening on the bitcoin network and it is a low fee transaction it is comparatively low to other mediums and channels through which today digital transactions are made now what is blockchain so bitcoin runs on the underlying technology of blockchain blockchain is a public distributed ledger in which transactions made in bitcoins or any other digital currency are recorded in a chronological order so let's see certain features it is cryptographically secure signed using your private key and then shared on the network with the public key it is immutable any record or any transaction added on the blockchain cannot be modified or altered it is run by a decentralized system there is no centralized authority or the body and the transactions are stored in containers aggregated in containers called blocks so a block is the smallest unit of a blockchain which records all the transaction a basic structure of a block is something like this it has four fields these are the primary attributes of a block it has something called as previous hash so the previous hash attribute stores the value of the hash of the previous block and that's how the blocks are linked to each other data this is the aggregated set of transactions which are included in this block so these are the set of transactions which were mined and validated and included in the block nonce so in proof of work consensus algorithm which is used in bitcoin nonce is a random value which is used to vary the output of the hash value so every block is supposed to generate a hash value and nonce is the parameter which is used to generate that hash value and the proof of work is the process of transaction verification done in blockchain now hash is the resultant hash value obtained by passing the previous hash value the data and the nonce through the sha256 algorithm to generate the hash of this block so this is the digital signature of the block which is generated and this is the basically identity of this block now sha256 is a cryptographic hash algorithm which produces a unique 256 bit alphanumeric hash value for any given input and that is the unique feature of this cryptographic algorithm whatever input you give it will always produce a 256 bit hash now let's understand the concepts of bitcoin mining what is bitcoin mining bitcoin mining is the process of verifying bitcoin transactions and recording them onto the public blockchain ledger in blockchain the transactions are verified 
by Bitcoin users. So basically the transactions have to be verified by none other than the participants of the network. Those who have the required hardware and computing power and those entities are called miners. So we will be talking about them later. But the point to be highlighted is that there is nothing like a centralized body as in case of legacy transactions where we used to be dependent on a regulatory or governing body or a bank to make our transactions go through. Now in Bitcoin here any user with mining hardware and internet access can take a part that kind of computer can be a participant and contribute to the mining community process is solved based on a difficult mathematical puzzle called proof of work so every miner's job is to solve the mathematical puzzle which is called proof of work in order to validate the transaction and earn the reward and all the miners as they are competing amongst themselves to mine a particular transaction the miner who first solves the puzzle gets the reward now users trying to sell the puzzle as i said are called miners they are the participants in the network who have the necessary hardware and computing power to do all the transactions to validate the transactions and validate it they are called as miners now in order to understand bitcoin mining we need to understand three major concepts of blockchain it is based on distributed public ledger it uses sha256 encryption algorithm and proof of work is the underlying consensus algorithm for bitcoin mining so distributed public ledger a distributed ledger is a record of all transactions maintained in the blockchain network across the globe in the network the validations of transaction is done by bitcoin users called as miners sha256 now blockchain prevents unauthorized access by using a hash function called sha256 to ensure that the blocks are kept secure they are digitally signed their hash value once generated cannot be altered now sha256 it takes an input string of any size and returns a fixed length 256 bit output value and that is the primary feature of sha256 encryption algorithm you give any input it will always give you a 256 bit output and it is a one way function you cannot derive the input reversefully from the output what you have generated and third is the proof of work in blockchain mining is a process to validate transactions by solving a difficult mathematical puzzle called proof of work now in order to do that the primary objective of the miner is to determine the nonce value and that nonce value is that mathematical puzzle that miners require to solve in order to generate a hash which is less than the target defined by the network for a particular block now in the bitcoin network users trying to solve mathematical puzzle are called as miners now the puzzle is solved by varying a nonce which produces a hash value lower than a predefined condition which is called as the target miners verify the transactions and add the block to the blockchain when confirmed and verified as of today the miners who solve the puzzle gets a reward of 12.5 bitcoins now once a block is added to the blockchain the bitcoins associated with the transactions can be spent so once the block is validated then the transfer of bitcoins associated with the transactions aggregated in the block the transfers are made then from one account to the another now in order to generate the hash let's see you use the sha256 hashing algorithm you define the hash value if it is less than the defined condition the target then the puzzle is deemed to be solved and if not then you keep on incrementing the nonce value and you repeat the sha256 hashing function passing on to the nonce value and you define generate the hash value again and you keep doing this process till the time you get the hash value which is less than the target now let's check an example so for example beyonce wants to share 10 bitcoin with jennifer now in order to do that what will be the steps so beyonce transaction data is shared with bitcoin users the miners from the memory pool the transaction goes and sits in a memory pool of unmined transactions so in a memory pool set of unmined or unconfirmed transactions wait until they are verified and included in a new block they remain in that unconfirmed transaction pool now miners competing to validate the transaction using proof of work 
they keep on continuously polling the unconfirmed transaction pool they pick up those transactions and start validating those transactions they, they aggregate in a data block and start validating they start solving the puzzle the miner who solves the puzzle first shares his result across the other nodes the other set of miners now once the block is been verified the nonce has been generated then the nodes will start granting their approval if maximum nodes grant their approval the block becomes valid and is added to the blockchain now simultaneously the miner who has solved the puzzle will also receive the reward in the meanwhile which will be of 12.5 bitcoin which as of today stands at 98k around dollars now the bitcoins the 10 btc for which the transaction was initiated now will get triggered and will get transferred from beyonce to jennifer now let's take a look at certain facts in proof of work a predefined condition the target is adjusted for every 2016 block which is approximately every 14 days and an average time to mine a block is 10 minutes so basically the target keeps automatically adjusting itself to keep the block generation within the 10 minute time frame so this is the representation so in order to keep the time frame for block generation within 10 minutes the target keeps on adjusting itself now the difficulty of the puzzle changes the target changes depending on the time it takes to mine a block so this is how a difficulty of a block is being generated it is the hash target of the first block divided by the hash target of the current block so this is the difficulty which is being changed after every 2016 blocks so basically it is very hard to generate the proof of work but it is very easy to verify by the miners so once you have solved the puzzle and you have broadcast it that yes you have earned you have validated a record you have determined the puzzle for other miners it is very easy to verify what you have done and once they give their consensus the majority then the block gets validated and gets added to the blockchain now since the difficulty depends on the hash target its value keep on changing after every 2016 block as i said and as you can see in due course from the day of inception of bitcoin in 2009 till today difficulty has increased exponentially and it has been increasing and thereby the entire effort of mining and the computing power is also increasing so as of what it was the resources which were required to do mining in 2009 you require more hashing power more computing power in order to do the mining today now what if someone tries to hack the data so let's see blockchain is a chain of blocks a b c now each block has solved a puzzle and generated a hash value of its own which is its identifier now suppose a person tries to tamper a block the block b and tries to change the data which is aggregated in the block so if the data of the block will change the hash value which is the digital signature of the block will also change thereby it will corrupt the chain which is subsequent to it basically the blocks ahead of block b will all get delinked because the previous hash value of block block c will not remain valid so in order for the hacker to make the entire blockchain valid for the block b which he has changed he has to change the hash value of all the blocks ahead of block b which will require huge huge amount of computing power which will be next to impossible so as you see the results in the following block being invalid so with this whole thing the blockchain is making sure that the entire sequence remains non-hackable and prevent data modification now let's see what are the underlying hardware requirements for bitcoin mining and how the hardware has evolved so in the early days miners used to solve the puzzles using regular processors the controlling processor unit cpus now but it used to take a lot of time for mining though the difficulty levels were low but still it used to take a lot of time now as i said the difficulties level keep on changing and uh, growing so the miners also had to increase the processing power so they discovered that graphical processing units gpus proved to be more efficient than regular CPUs so but this also had a drawback of consumption of electricity so any miner who has to calculate the return on investment on the hardware he also has to accommodate the cost of electricity and other resources which are going in in order to do the mining so finally as of today 
they are using a hardware called ASIC application specific integrated circuit which was specifically introduced for mining which consumes less power and has a higher computing power and a better hardware for mining so miners are profitable when their cost of resources to mine one block is less than the price of the reward they receive so definitely they have to have the investment less than the reward what they earn so as of today in blockchain miners use their resources to verify a transaction they each time a block is mined new bitcoins are created in the network so the bitcoin total supply is limited it is at 21 million dollars approximately 21 million bitcoins are in supply 17 to 18 million bitcoins have already been mined so only 3 to 4 million are left as of today a reward of 12.5 bitcoin is given to the miner on doing the transaction verification but the bitcoin mining reward goes by the halving principle the reward given to a miner is half every 210000 block which is approximately every 4 years so then after that threshold is reached the bitcoin reward will go down to 6.25 bitcoins so let's take an example of a lottery ticket where your chances of winning is difficult so we are talking about what is bitcoin mining pool your chances of winning the lottery is difficult but in a community if individuals buy multiple lottery tickets and pool their tickets together then this will increase their probability and chances of winning more so suppose you won the lottery then based on the contribution the reward is distributed among all the participants bitcoin mining pool is a similar thing it's a process where multiple nodes share their resources together to mine a block now when a block is sold the miners split the reward equally based on the amount of processing power they have invested so it takes the pool members to generate a final hash value then it checks how much amount of work was contributed by each pool member and as a result the bitcoin reward gets distributed proportionally amongst the participants now let's take a look at a demo on how can you see what is the bitcoin reward now this is a actual block of the bitcoin network as you can see this is a block and this is the block reward 12.5 bitcoins so this was a block which was mined this is the block number and these are the set of transactions which were part of this block now once this block was mined by the miner all these transactions then be done these are the transfers of bitcoin from one account to the other this is the nonce which was generated by the miner or the mining pool in order to mine the block and these are the other attributes and if you take a look at this url this is an example of a mining pool it's a demo account where the participants have shared their mining resources and they are mining it in a pool and see this is the reward for which they are mining this is the unconfirmed reward this is the confirmed reward this is what they have already validated and this is what they have earned so far and let's see what's in store for us today so what's in it for you today we are going to understand why do we need blockchain wallet what is a blockchain wallet how do these wallet work what are the different types of blockchain wallets their comparisons and a demo on the usage of these blockchain wallets and we will try to do certain transactions using these wallets now before these blockchain wallets came into existence what were the means in order for us to do the transactions and what were the drawbacks in the old days the transactions with whatever medium and channels we had the problems were that the transactions were slow and banks were the central point of failure basically any transaction which has to go through has to go through some intermediary channels and has to pass through certain intermediaries like bank which makes them a single point of failure also there are issues in keeping track of all accounts and balances data get jeopardized manipulated or even get corrupted across multiple systems where the accounts and balances are maintained now here comes into existence what is called as blockchain wallet now what is blockchain wallet a blockchain wallet is a cryptocurrency wallet that allows users to manage different kind of cryptocurrencies for example bitcoin ethereum etc now a blockchain wallet helps exchanging of funds easily transactions are secure as they are cryptographically signed the wallet is accessible from web or mobile devices 
and the privacy and identity of the user is maintained. So therefore, a blockchain wallet provides all the features which are necessary for a safe and secure transfer and exchange of funds between different parties. A blockchain wallet is a typical cryptocurrency wallet that allows users to manage cryptocurrencies. It is very similar to the process of sending or receiving money through PayPal or any other gateway which you use today. But now you can use cryptocurrency instead, similar to PayPal, which you're using for making transactions with your fiat currency. Now let's take a look at the ecosystem of blockchain wallets. Here are certain examples like Electrum, Blockchain.info, Jax, Mycelium, Samurai and Bitcoin Paper Wallet. These are just to name a few blockchain wallets which are existing in the market but there are many more based on the requirement you have, based on the security you require and based on the kind of wallet which suffices your need. So we will see what are the categorizations of these kind of wallets are. Now how do blockchain wallets work? Let's take a look. So before we move on to how blockchain wallets work, let's understand what a private and a public key is and how are these keys related to a blockchain wallet. Now whenever you create a blockchain wallet, you are also provided a private and a public key which is associated with your wallet. Now let's take an example in order to understand this. Imagine a person knowing your email address is sending you an email. So in our regular day to day activity, if we want to receive an email from someone, we give him or her our email ID and expect an email from them. Now, what if an unknown person is able to send emails through my account? So I am giving my email address for receiving email, but when I am disclosing my email ID, I'm not assuming that someone will be able to send emails through my account because then for that he has to be aware of my email account password so knowing your email address will not give a person the ability to send an email from your account you are not giving your password to the person to send an email you're just giving the email address to send an email from a particular email address an individual has to be aware of the password associated with it now blockchain wallet follows a similar process using public key and private key both together public key is similar to your email address Address. So basically whenever your wallet is generated a public key is generated you can share that public key with anyone in order to receive funds private key is top secret it's similar to your password it should not get hacked or you should not disclose it to anyone and you use this private key to spend your funds so now instead of sending an email imagine you want to transfer money to your friend this transfer process is done through your blockchain wallet with blockchain wallets you can now send and receive cryptocurrencies. So as I said, a blockchain wallet has two keys, a public key and a private key. Public key is shared with everyone, just like an email address. Private key is just like your password, which should be kept secret with the sender. So with blockchain wallet, no one will be able to send crypto coins, just like emails through your public key until they know your private key. But if someone gets access to your private key, there is a high possibility that your account is hacked and you might end up losing all the cryptocurrency deposits in your account. Now let's take a look. What are the typical features of a blockchain wallet? It's easy to use. It's just like any other software or a wallet which you use for your day-to-day -day transactions. It is highly secure. It is just a matter of you securing your private key and it allows instant transactions across geographies, barrier-free, without intermediaries and also these transactions charges you low cost fee. And these wallets help you do transactions across multiple cryptocurrencies. So you can make payments across cryptocurrencies, which helps you do easy currency conversions. Now let's talk about what are the different types of blockchain wallets. Now basically there are two types of blockchain wallets based on the private keys. One is hot wallet and another is the cold wallet. Hot wallets are like normal wallets which we carry for day-to-day -day transactions and these wallets are user-friendly. Cold wallets. Cold wallets are similar to a vault where cryptocurrencies are stored with a high level of security. Now let's take a look at the differences. 
Hot wallets are online wallets through which cryptocurrencies can be transferred quickly. They are available online on internet. Example, Coinbase, Blockchain.info. Cold wallets, they are digital offline wallets where the transactions are signed offline and then later disclosed online. So they are not maintained on the cloud, on the internet. They are maintained offline to have high security. And the examples of cold wallets are Treasure and ledger. Now, in case of hot wallets, private keys are stored in the cloud for faster transfer. In case of cold wallets, private keys are stored in a separate hardware which are disconnected from the internet or the cloud or are stored in a paper based document. Hot wallets, they are easy to access, available online 24 7. It can be accessed through desktop or mobile but has a risk of unrecoverable theft when hacked. Cold wallet, this method of transaction helps in protecting the wallet from unauthorized access from hacking and other online vulnerabilities. Now, the wallet can be further distinguished on these criteria. There can be software wallets, there can be hardware wallets which are like kind of USB driven and you plug into your USB drive and your hardware wallet can be used or they are a typical paper based wallet where you print your public key and a private key on a paper and keep it in a secure place. Let's talk about software wallet. A software wallet is an application that is downloaded on a device. Either it could be a desktop or a mobile or it could be a web based wallet which can be accessed online. Now here are certain examples. Dax, Bread Wallet and Copay are the popular software wallets. So software wallet can be further categorized into desktop wallet, online or we can call it web wallet or mobile wallet. Now desktop wallet are like cold wallet in which the private keys are stored in cold servers. Basically the desktop wallets, the private keys are stored in your desktop. You can unplug it from the internet, do some offline transactions and then bring it back online. Now in case the main server is lost, then a cold server, basically your desktop is used as a backup server. These wallets can be downloaded on any computer but can only be accessed from the system they are installed on. So you make sure the desktop or the machine on which you have downloaded the desktop wallet is safe, has a backup, you are maintaining the hardware, you are not letting the machine go anywhere and it is on a secure location. Now these wallets are definitely cost efficient and one of the examples is Electrum and is one of the most popular desktop wallet. Online wallets are the other kind of hot wallets that run on the cloud that are available on the internet. Now here users have the benefit of accessing these wallets across any device. It could be tablet, desktop or you can use it from your mobile browser. The private keys are stored online and are managed by a third party. You have to be dependent on a third party service. So for example, Green Address is a Bitcoin wallet which is available on the web, has an Android app, is available on a desktop and also is available on iOS, Apple. Mobile wallets. Mobile wallets are like similar to online wallets except that they are built only for mobile phone usage and accessibility. These wallets are also user friendly and they have a user friendly interface for which helps you in doing transactions easily. The example is Mycelium which is the best available mobile wallet. Hardware wallets. Hardware wallet is a type of a cold storage device typically like a USB which stores the user's private key in a protected hardware device. These wallets are similar to portable devices that can be connected to the computer, can be plugged in. As I said earlier, it is less prone to malware attacks, malicious attacks and it is hack proof. Examples are Nano Ledger, Trezor and Kiki are the top hardware wallets available in the market. To make a transaction from your hardware wallet, you have to ensure the hardware wallet is plugged into your computer system before you can do a transaction from your hardware wallet. Paper wallet. A paper wallet is an offline process for storing cryptocurrencies. This wallet is a printed paper consisting of both your private key and a public key which are accessed using a QR code. Now since these wallets are safe, they are widely used for storing large amounts of cryptocurrencies. Now example are Bitcoin paper wallet and MyEther wallet are one of the widely used paper wallets. But the question arises, how do I add cryptocurrency in my paper wallet? In order to make a transaction with your paper wallet, paper wallet works with your software wallets, the online wallets. 
to transfer funds from your software wallet to the public address shown on your paper wallet. So basically first you park your funds in a software wallet then you transfer the funds from your software wallet to the public address printed on your paper wallet. Now let's do the comparison blockchain info blockchain info is a cryptocurrency wallet which supports bitcoin and ethereum it is easy to use and has a low transaction fee it has its apis exposed you can easily use them to order to make your own custom wallets also ledger nano ledger nano is a hardware wallet which offers a high security to your account it is available for bitcoin ethereum and litecoin users it is also possible to maintain multiple accounts and access them anytime bitcoin paper wallet paper wallet helps you to print your own tamper resistant bitcoin wallet it minimizes the threat of hacking jax Jax is a software wallet which enables a user to exchange currencies within the wallet. It is available for Bitcoin, Ethereum, Litecoin and many other cryptocurrencies. With Jax, a user can view his updated balance as soon as the processing is complete. Now, let's take a look at certain demos for the different kind of wallets we have talked about. So, let's first take an example of paper wallet. So, bitaddress.org provides you a paper wallet. It uses the client side JavaScript in order to generate a random hash for your wallet. So, you keep moving your mouse and it will generate a hash public and private key. It is recommended that when you are doing this process, you should be disconnected from the internet and once these keys are generated, you can print it and keep it secure and clear the cache of your browser. So as you can see on the screen, this is my public key for receiving my bitcoins and this is the private key for me to spend that. I can print it and keep it handy with me but of course the safety of these physical documents cannot be entirely guaranteed if a hacker discovers the location of your paper wallet and physically steals it then they can access your bitcoin holdings so basically it is of high importance that you keep the paper wallet in a very very secure location some users hide or disguise the paper wallet it should be protected from physical damage if the keys fade or can no longer be scanned then the user will never again be able to access the bitcoin which are parked in that address also take care if you are using an incorrect type of printer that also may damage the paper wallet now let's take a look for our second example of online wallet here we are taking an example of bitpay so you can download bitpay online and create your account over here you can create a personal wallet you can create a shared wallet or a joint share wallet once you create a wallet like if you see the example over here this is my personal wallet and i have 3.645 test bitcoins over here now in order to receive test bitcoins in my account you can receive these test bitcoins from testnet.coinfaucet.eu in now in order to receive it you just need to copy your bitcoin address in the testnet address so the test net has given me 0.87 bitcoin so now my balance has increased from 3.5 to 3.64 and i can see this transaction see three minutes ago i just received 0.872287 bitcoin the transaction is still in process but in a while as this transaction is getting mined on the test net i will receive it now as I have received it, I can even make a transaction and send it to someone. So from my personal account, I can send Bitcoin to someone whose Bitcoin address I have and I have to just paste it over here. 
transfer to Bitcoin wallet. Either I can select one of my own wallets or I can search for any other Bitcoin address which someone has shared with me and I can send it to that particular address. Now let's take an example of our hardware wallet. How does hardware wallet works with the online wallets? So here we have metamask which has a feature of connecting with hardware wallet so once you have metamask installed you will see this option of connect hardware wallet now metamask has provided support for trezor so now once you connect your hardware wallet the usb with your computer you can select an account you want to view on that particular hardware wallet and you can only choose one at a time and then you can start using that particular wallet for your decentralized apps so basically once you have your hardware connected it is integrated with your metamask and then you can start running your decentralized apps so that they can start using the tokens or the currency in the particular hardware wallet so use your hardware account like you would with any ethereum account log into dapps and send ethereums buy and store erc20 tokens and non-fungible tokens like crypto cookies so if you click connect to trezor over here metamask will start looking out for the connected treasure device. Thank you for a fascinating session Saurabh. Now let us learn how blockchain and ethereum are different from one another. After which we will tell you 10 things you probably didn't know about bitcoin, some applications of blockchain and how you can become a blockchain developer. And today we are going to talk about bitcoin versus ethereum. Now before we get into it, let's see what the Nobel Prize winner in economics, Milton Friedman had to say in 1999. He believed that the internet was going to be one of the major forces in reducing the role of the government. He also believed that the one thing that was missing was reliable electronic cash. And just like he predicted, in 2009, the cryptocurrency Bitcoin was born. So what exactly is a cryptocurrency? A cryptocurrency works very similar to how our normal currency works. Now normal currency could be dollar, euro, pound, yen, rupees and so on. Now any form of currency that isn't a cryptocurrency falls under the banner of normal currency. The normal currency is also known as fiat currency. Now the major difference between cryptocurrencies and fiat currencies is that cryptocurrencies are decentralized. What does that mean? This means that cryptocurrencies don't have a central authority controlling them. Now for example they don't have a bank or a government that regulate how the cryptocurrency works. In a way, the cryptocurrency works in a very democratic fashion. Any change that needs to take place is done only after a majority of the people using the cryptocurrency agree to it. Cryptocurrencies and fiat currencies are similar because both of them were created as a medium of exchange. However, that's where the similarity ends. With cryptocurrencies, there are no third parties involved. For example, with fiat currencies, you have banks, your money lenders, governments, and so on. With cryptocurrencies, we have cryptographic functions to ensure that the transactions are kept secure. Bitcoin uses the SHA-256 algorithm to ensure that the transactions are kept secure. But most importantly, cryptocurrencies use blockchain. Now, a blockchain is a set of records that are placed into a container known as a block. Now, these transactions are kept public and in a chronological order. So what is Bitcoin? Bitcoin, which was released in 2009 by the still unknown Satoshi Nakamoto, is a cryptocurrency that's decentralized, which means that there's no central authority that controls how it works. It works using encryption techniques like the SHA-256 algorithm to help people send and receive money across the world. Now, as I mentioned before, the payments are secured using cryptography. The most important point about Bitcoin is that it helps keep the identity of the people sending and receiving money anonymous. The transaction fee is also very low. Now we all know that when we perform a transaction with the bank, some amount of money or service charge is levied on us. However, with Bitcoin, this value is very very low. So what is Ether or Ethereum? Ethereum, which was created in 2015 by Vitalik Buterin, is a cryptocurrency which provides Ether tokens. This is equivalent to bitcoins that you find in the bitcoin network. Ether is used by users to build and deploy decentralized applications. Now these are applications whose backend code is placed in a distributed peer-to-peer -peer network. Now this is different from a regular application as the backend code is placed in a centralized server in this case. Ether is also used to pay for services like the computational power that is required before a block can be added to the blockchain and as transaction fees. Ether also works very similar to how Bitcoin works and can be used for peer-to-peer -peer payments. Ether can also be used to create smart contracts. 
Now, smart contracts work in such a way that when a certain set of predefined rules are satisfied, a particular output takes place. If you are interested in learning more about smart contracts, I suggest you click on the top right corner and watch our what is a smart contract video. And now for the thing you've been waiting for, Bitcoin versus Ethereum. Now on one side, we have Bitcoin. Now Bitcoin has proven itself to be a very popular and well-known cryptocurrency among everyone in the world. It also has the highest market cap among all the cryptocurrencies available right now. In a way, it's the current world champion when it comes to cryptocurrencies. On the other side, we have the underdog Ethereum. Now Ethereum did not have the revolutionary effect that Bitcoin did, but it learned from Bitcoin and produced more functionalities on the concepts of Bitcoin. It is the second most valuable cryptocurrency in the market right now. So in a way, this is the fight between the underdog and the world champion. Who do you think will win? Now, let's understand how Bitcoin and Ethereum are different from each other. Bitcoin was the first cryptocurrency to be ever created. It was released in 2009 by a group of people or a person known as Satoshi Nakamoto. No one really knows if this person is alive or dead. However, with this technology came the concept of blockchain, which is still revolutionizing institutions around the world. On the other side, Ethereum was released in 2015 by a researcher and a programmer named Vitalik Buterin. Now, Vitalik used the concepts of blockchain and Bitcoin and improved upon it, providing a lot more functionality, creating the Ethereum platform for distributed applications and smart contracts. Bitcoin enables peer-to-peer -peer transactions. Bitcoin in this case acts as a replacement for fiat currencies, just that it removes all the problems associated with fiat currencies. For starters, you don't have to pay high transaction fees for a transaction. At the same time, you also don't have a centralized authority that regulates how Bitcoins work. On the other hand, we have Ethereum, which enables peer-to-peer -peer transactions and also provides a platform for creating and building smart contracts and distributed applications. A smart contract allows users to exchange just about anything of value, be it shares, money, real estate, and so on. In Bitcoin, miners are able to validate transactions with a method known as proof of work. This is the same with Ethereum as well. Proof of work involves miners around the world trying to solve a complicated mathematical puzzle to be the first one to add a block to the blockchain. Ethereum, however, will be moving to something known as proof of stake. The concept of proof of stake works in such a way that a person can mine or validate transactions in a block based on how many coins he or she owns. The more the amount of coins that a person owns, the larger their mining power will be. In the case of Bitcoin, every time a miner adds a block to the blockchain, they're rewarded with 12.5 Bitcoins. This reward that they receive is expected to halve every 210,000 blocks. Now, the next time the reward is going to halve is in the year 2020, where the reward will reduce from 12.5 Bitcoins to 6.25 Bitcoins per block. In the case of Ethereum, a miner or a validator receives a value of 3 Ether every time a block is added to the blockchain. The transaction fees in Bitcoin is completely optional. You can pay the miner more amounts of money to have them give special attention to your transaction. However, as I mentioned before, the transaction will go through even if you don't provide any money. On the other hand, it is absolutely necessary that you provide some amount of Ether for your transaction to be successful. The ether that you provide will get converted into a unit called gas. Now this gas drives the computation that allows your transaction to be added to the blockchain. Now let's talk about the average amount of time it takes to add a block to the blockchain. In the case of Bitcoin, it takes 10 minutes to add a block to the blockchain. In the case of Ethereum, it takes only about 12 to 15 seconds for the same process. Now let's talk about hashing algorithms or how these systems can maintain their privacy and ensure security. Bitcoin uses a hashing algorithm known as SHA-256. Ethereum uses a cryptographic algorithm called ETHash. Now, let's talk about some important values associated with Bitcoin and Ethereum. The total number of coins that each of them have are 17 million Bitcoins and 101 million Ether. Now, you can see that Ethereum has easily crossed the 100 million mark. However, the market capitalization for Bitcoins is 110 billion US dollars, whereas for Ethereum, it's only 28 billion. So even though Ethereum has a larger number of coins in the market, it does not reach up to the level of Bitcoin. The number of transactions that take place in a day for Bitcoin is 219,000. And at the same time for Ethereum, it's 659,000. Now you can see this throughout July, where the number of transactions per day stay more or less the same for Bitcoin and Ethereum. 
Now, the number of blocks that are created for Bitcoin is 537,000. For Ethereum, that goes up to 6 billion. Now, this has more to do with the fact that the amount of time it takes for a block to be added to Ethereum is much less as compared to Bitcoin. Now, the block size for Bitcoin is 628.286 kilobytes and 25.134 kilobytes for Ethereum. Now, you can see that the market value of Bitcoin is significantly higher than any form of digital currency in the market right now. It is, however, closely followed by Ether, which hopes to take over one day. And now for the big question, which one is better? The answer depends entirely on your requirements. Bitcoin works better as a peer-to-peer -peer transaction system and Ethereum works well when you need to create and build distributed applications and smart contracts. At the end of the day, the choice is entirely up to you. Five industries that blockchain will disrupt. Let's start with banking. Suppose you are in San Francisco and you want to send money to your friend. Now, for this transfer to take place, you need the help of a central authority. In this case, it's the bank. Now, say you're sending them $100. Now, out of this $100, $10 goes as transaction fee to the bank. The rest goes to your friend, which is $90. Now, this transaction fee at times can be expensive. The process of transferring money can also be time consuming. The act of sending money overseas is also a lot more complicated due to the exchange rates and other hidden fees. Now, blockchain is disrupting the system by providing a peer-to-peer -peer payment system. Now, this provides high security and doesn't cost as much. This system eliminates the need of a central authority. Now, blockchain provides fast, cheap and borderless payments across the world. You can perform transfers to any part of the world. Now, cryptocurrencies like Bitcoin eliminates the need for a third party, in this case a bank, to make transactions. Now, blockchain records all the transactions in a decentralized ledger. This ledger is accessible by any of the Bitcoin users. For example, let's talk about a cryptocurrency application called Abra. This provides peer-to-peer -peer money transfers. Now, this application allows users to store, transfer and receive digital money which can be stored in their mobile phones or PCs. The recipient can withdraw this cash via an Abra teller. The most important thing here is that users don't need to have a bank account to use this service. Next up, we have cybersecurity. Now, imagine you're in office one day and you find out that your data has been modified. The previous evening, someone went through your data and altered it. Now, cyber attacks are a huge cause of concern among the public. It can have huge repercussions to a person's life. So, it's essential that we find an effective solution against people going through our data unauthorized and tampering it. That's where blockchain comes in. Blockchain, with its decentralized system, makes it suitable for environments where there's a lot of security required. All the information that's stored inside the Bitcoin networks are verified and encrypted using a cryptographic algorithm. Now, this ensures that there's no single point of entrance for a wide-scale attack. Now, with blockchain, it's also easy to identify malicious attacks due to the peer-to-peer -peer connections where data cannot be altered or tampered. By ensuring that there's no central authority, blockchain provides a transparent and secure way of recording transactions. This is at the same time ensuring that none of your private information is disclosed to anyone. For example, let me tell you about a company called GuardTime that secures its data using blockchain technology. Now, GuardTime uses a completely unorthodox method as opposed to a centralized system. This company uses blockchain technology. It distributes the data among the nodes of its users. Now, let's talk about supply chain management. Say you ordered for some food from online, you get the delivery for the food, you get the food delivered to you, and you find out that the food has surprisingly low quality. Now, with blockchain technology, you can trace the supply chain back to its beginning to find out where things went wrong. For example, you can find out where the farm is, where the product is grown, how the production was, whether something went wrong with the distributor, whether something went wrong with the retailer, or something went wrong at your hand. Now, in supply chain management, blockchain provides permanent transparency and validation of transaction shared by multiple supply chain partners. That means you can validate each and every step of the supply chain. All the blockchain entries are permanent and transparent. This makes it easier for the customer to view the transaction history of the product they just purchased. In a blockchain, transactions are recorded in a decentralized, distributed ledger. Each transaction is recorded into a block and anyone can verify the authenticity or status of a product being delivered. Now, it can also be used for seafood verification. Here, we can track the seafood from ocean to the market. Now, take the example of the Pacific Tuna project. Now, you have three blocks here, each one containing fishing details, export and import details, and purchasing details. The blockchain supply chain management provides a step-by-step -step verification to track the tuna fish. In the process, this prevents illegal fishing. Next up, we have healthcare. Say you're in a hospital and you're asking for reports for a medical test you did yesterday. The receptionist tells you to wait. And even after four hours, you still don't get your report. Apart from this annoying delay, 
Have you realized that any person who has access to the system can corrupt the data apart from this annoying delay? Have you realized that any person who has access to the system can corrupt the data since information is stored in the physical memory of a system? Blockchain eliminates a central authority and ensures that you have rapid access to data. Here, each block is connected to another block and the data is distributed across the nodes. This makes it difficult for a hacker to corrupt the data. Another major problem in healthcare is counterfeit medication. The main issue is that counterfeit medicines are difficult to distinguish from real medicines. The solution comes in the form of blockchain with the help of supply chain management. Here, the medicine's provenance can be traced. For example, United Healthcare has improved its privacy, security and interoperability of medical records using blockchain. Now, Time for some honorable mentions. The insurance industry. With blockchain's decentralized system, insurance companies can easily identify false claims and prevent forgeries. Transportation. Utilizing blockchain enables traceability in the transportation industry where the shipment of goods can be easily tracked. Now let me tell you about cloud storage with an example. Storage is a decentralized cloud storage. By eliminating servers and utilizing blockchain, it can securely store its data in the cloud. With high speed and low cost, users can earn money by sharing their extra hard drive space on the storage network. Real Estate Deploying blockchain technology in real estate increases the speed of the conveyance process and eliminates the necessity for money exchanges. Let's talk about the government. In a traditional voting process, electoral fraud is an illegal activity that takes place almost always. Now, most citizens who want to vote must wait in a queue and cast their vote to a local authority. This can be a very time-consuming process. Why not bring this process online? Online voting systems fail due to the lack of security. Blockchain can be used to solve these issues. It can be used for counting votes and verifying voters. Using blockchain, voters can submit their votes without revealing their identity in public. Officials can count the votes with absolute accuracy, knowing that each ID has only one vote associated with it. Fake votes cannot be created as data tampering is close to impossible with blockchain. Once your vote is added to the ledger, the information can never be erased. Now, let me tell you an example of MeVote. Now, MeVote is a token-based blockchain platform which is very similar to a digital ballot box. Now, with MeVote, people are able to vote through a smartphone so voters cast their vote. After the verification, the vote gets recorded in the blockchain, the voter identities are secured and the results are not modified. But blockchain is also useful in some other things. For digital asset registries, with blockchain, fast and secure registration of any asset is possible. It can be used with the notary. Utilizing blockchain's technology with the notary seal can be a really fast way to prove a document's authenticity. With tax, deploying blockchain can result in quicker tax payments, lower rates of tax evasion and lesser efforts in tax auditing. Blockchain can increase security and transparency in governmental systems. By 2020, Dubai hopes to become a 100% blockchain government by making all of its government services available on the blockchain technology. 10 things you didn't know about Bitcoin Firstly, we have the mysterious creator. Now, in 2009, a person or a group of people known as Satoshi Nakamoto introduced Bitcoin to the world. He vanished off the internet in late 2010. He hasn't been heard from since. Now, just like his identity is shrouded in mystery, nobody really knows if he's even alive or dead. The only communication people had with him were through emails and forums. His Bitcoin wallet holds around 980,000 Bitcoins, which makes him one of the richest people on the planet. Next up, we have the Satoshi. Now, as a sign of respect for the Bitcoin's creator, the smallest unit of a Bitcoin is known as a Satoshi. One Satoshi is valued at around 0.00006694 US dollars, which is a very, very low value. Now, to make one Bitcoin, you need approximately 100 million Satoshis. Now, according to the current Bitcoin values, which fluctuates a lot, to make a dollar, you'd need close to 15,800 Satoshis. Losing Bitcoins. Losing your Bitcoin address, which is also known as your private key, not only means losing your unique identification, it also means you lose all the bitcoins in your wallet. Research shows that at least 60% of all bitcoin addresses are ghosts, which means a huge chunk of the population that's using the bitcoin network have lost their addresses. Now, these are the people who have lost their addresses and have no way to access their wallet. Liberland. Now, in April 2015, a micronation between Croatia and Serbia known as Liberland was born. Now, this was founded by Vid Jelka, a politician, publicist, activist, and the president of Liberland. Now, the official currency of Liberland is Bitcoin. Now, the government took this move, believing that Bitcoin and its underlying concepts of blockchain provides a secure and transparent method for recording electronic, financial, and physical assets. Processing Power The process of mining Bitcoins is a 
expensive process. Now you pay a high toll to do this, like your money, your time and electricity. Now mining bitcoins requires servers that are used for that specific purpose alone. Now the faster you process the data, the faster the block can be added to the blockchain and the faster you are rewarded with bitcoins. Power consumption. Now just imagine how much electricity Ireland consumes in a year. Approximately 5000 kilowatt hour. Now how much do you think all the bitcoin mining farms together consume? 60 terawatt hours, which is approximately 6 into 10 raised to 10 kilowatt hours, which is a large amount of power. Now the entire country of Ireland, which is the second most populated city in Europe and has 84,421 km square of area, consumes lesser electricity than all these farms combined. Bitcoin ban. Now, although several countries around the world, like Canada and America, have wholeheartedly accepted Bitcoin, there are some that haven't. Countries like Bolivia, Iceland, Bangladesh and Ecuador have completely banned the usage of Bitcoins. There are also countries like India, Thailand and Iran who ask their residents to be careful while using cryptocurrencies. They haven't completely banned it, however. They do not accept it as a legal tender though. Limited number. There's a limit to how many Bitcoins can exist in the market. This number is capped at 21 million bitcoins. As of this moment, 17 million bitcoins are already in circulation. To give you an idea, that's almost 80% of the 21 million already done. But don't worry, until 2140, we'll still have bitcoins to mine. This is because of how miners are rewarded. Now, miners are rewarded with 12.5 bitcoins for each block added to the blockchain. And every four years, the reward reduces by half. The next halving is supposed to occur in 2020 where the reward reduces to 6.25 bitcoins. The power of B. The terms bitcoin with an uppercase B and bitcoin with a lowercase B mean two different things. The only thing that differentiates the two into two completely different things is the letter B. The lowercase B in bitcoin refers to the cryptocurrency that is used to perform the transactions. The uppercase B in bitcoin refers to the ledger that stores information regarding these transactions. Faster than supercomputers. The world's fastest supercomputer, the Summit, works at 122.3 petaflops, which is nothing but a quadrillion floating point operations per second. Now, if you take the Bitcoin network completely into consideration, the processing power is about 80,704,290 petaflops. But the only thing here is that a supercomputer can do several different things. But the only thing the Bitcoin network does is add blocks to the blockchain. And with that, we've reached the end of the video. I hope you guys enjoyed it and have learned something new about Bitcoin. If you feel like we've missed out on something interesting that you've come across, let us know in the comments below. And today we're going to do something very interesting. Today we're going to go through some of the applications of blockchain. Now before we get into it, let me tell you what exactly is a blockchain. Now a blockchain is a list of records or blocks which stores data publicly and in a chronological order. Now the data within these blocks or records are secured using cryptography. They don't have a central authority controlling them. Anyone has access to the data within this network, but not everyone can alter the data and everyone has copies of this data. So now that you know what blockchain is, let's get into this video. Today we'll be talking about blockchain when it's used in supply chain management, blockchain and cybersecurity, how blockchain is used for voting and other applications of blockchain. So now let's have a look at supply chain management. Now let's look at a scenario before blockchain. So there's a delivery boy bringing John his order of apples. Now John thanks him and sees that his apples are wrong and John says that he wants his money back. However, the delivery boy says he can't help since he's just the delivery boy, not the person who created the product. So these problems are the ones that were faced before blockchain. But with blockchain technology, there is traceability across the supply chain. This means that you can trace back to what happened to the product at each step of the supply chain. Blockchain technology enables these transactions to be tracked in a very secure and transparent manner. Now, some benefits of using blockchain technology are that there's a single record policy, which means there's a single record throughout the entire supply chain. There's reduced costs since there's no requirement for multiple records across the entire supply chain. There's eliminating error and less human intervention. Now, the last two points come somewhat in correlation since the lesser the human intervention, usually the lesser the amount of error. Let's have a look at an example of a supply chain management. So the product starts from the farm, goes through storage, undergoes food processing, it's manufactured, distributed, given to the retailer and finally reaches the customer. Now in supply chain management, blockchain is able to provide 
a permanent record, a whole lot of transparency and the ability to validate the transactions that are shared across multiple supply chain partners. With blockchain, the transactions are recorded in a decentralized distributed ledger. Now, the advantage of this is that anyone can verify the authenticity or the status of a product that is being delivered. Now, if you want to look at a real life example, you have to look no further than Walmart. Walmart is building a blockchain distributed ledger so that they can connect and track poke suppliers, shippers, purchasers, and other units involved in its supply chain that are delivering the food product across China. Now, this is done to reduce the risk of data tampering or inaccuracy or inaccuracy. Now, let's have a look at how blockchain helps cybersecurity. Imagine the scenario where A is sending $20 to B. A sends this money and this transaction details are stored in the cloud. Now, what if a hacker hacks the data within the cloud and tampers this? He tampers this in such a way that he receives the $20 instead of B. Here you can see the hacker being all smug about it. Now, this is the main problem with the current banking system. Now, it is prone to cyber attacks because it has a centralized network. This can also lead to fraud as well as data theft. Cyber attacks are one of the biggest threats that the public has to face. However, blockchain is a solution that makes sure that your data is protected from tampering as well as helps improving cybersecurity across a number of different industries. Some of the benefits are that it provides high security with the help of the cryptography that I mentioned before. It has a decentralized storage, quick transactions which take only about 10 minutes and lower cost as compared to banking transaction costs. Now, let's look at the same scenario but with the help of bitcoins or blockchain. Now, A is sending 0 0.0025 bitcoins to B which amounts to approximately $20. These bitcoins are sent and blockchain which is a distributed ledger distributes the data across multiple nodes within the network and secures this data using cryptography. Another thing that you have to remember is that each node has a copy of the ledger and cryptography protects the data within it against any changes making it immutable. Now imagine a hacker trying to hack the data here. He's unsuccessful because the peer-to-peer -peer connection which prevents data from being altered as well as tampered. Now, and finally, B receives the $20 in Bitcoins. Now, for a real-life application, MasterCard has its own blockchain project where MasterCard is using blockchain for sending as well as receiving money. It also allows the exchange of currency without the need of a central authority. Now, let's have a look at how blockchain can help with the voting process. Now, before blockchain, a voter would have to submit their voter ID. Their voter IDs need to be verified and after the verification, the voter would submit his or her vote to the EVM or the electronic voting machine. After that, the voting is complete. However, it is possible for the EVM to be hacked since it's a centralized system. This can lead to some amount of manipulation with the vote count. However, with a decentralized system like blockchain, it is possible to completely eliminate any scope of forgery as well as data manipulation. Now, let's have a look at how voting can be performed with the help of blockchain. Now, first, the voter downloads a voting application. The voter submits a voter ID and registers for the election. After the verification is complete, the voter has been authorized to cast his or her vote and the voter submits his or her vote without revealing their identity to the public. Now, once this vote has been added to the blockchain, the information within the blockchain can never be erased. After this, the officials can count these votes knowing that each ID can be attributed to just one vote. Now, with blockchain, voters can also count the number of votes themselves. Using blockchain in the voting process provides complete transparency by eliminating any need for third-party systems to be involved. Along with that, it can also eliminate voter fraud as well as election rigging. It increases the transparency in the voting process and reduces the expense of conducting the elections. Now, in real-life examples, MeVote, which is a token-based blockchain platform, works very similar to that of a digital ballot box. Now, it protects the integrity of the vote as well as protects the security of the election process. Now, this is already implemented in Australia, so it's only a matter of time before this or similar technologies can be set up across the world. Now, let's have a look at some of the other applications. There's insurance, where with blockchain, they can eliminate forgery as well as false claims and real estate where this increases the speed of the conveyance process and eliminates any requirement for money exchanges. So if talking about blockchain and its applications have caught your interest, I suggest we get on to simplylearn.com. I'm going to tell you how you can become a blockchain developer. Now before we begin, let's see the current situation of the market. 84% of companies are now dabbling into blockchain. Blockchain is the fastest growing skill in the US freelance job market. Apple's Steve Wozniak is getting involved with blockchain projects 
and JP Morgan CIO believes that blockchain will replace existing technology. As we can see, with the amount of focus organizations are putting on blockchain and what tech influencers around the world have to say about it, we can see clearly that they really believe that blockchain can have a tremendous positive impact on our lives and the market as a whole. So it's no surprise that blockchain has worldwide acclaim now. It's created a huge number of job opportunities across the world. And one such job is that of a blockchain developer. So here's what we're going to learn today. Who is a blockchain developer? What are the types of blockchain developers? The steps you have to follow to become a blockchain developer? The obstacles you might face while learning blockchain? The salaries offered to blockchain developers? And how companies are using blockchain right now? So who is a blockchain developer? A blockchain developer is someone who designs, implements and supports a blockchain network. So in a way, they are responsible for setting up the blockchain network and then ensuring that it works properly. They create and optimize blockchain protocols. For example, is the network a public network? They create such protocols and then optimize it based on their usage or requirement. They develop distributed applications and smart contracts on the blockchain network. Now, let's talk about the different types of blockchain developers. So they fall under two major categories, core blockchain developers and blockchain software developers. A core blockchain developer works on the core features and the architecture of the blockchain network. Basically, they're in charge of the entire blockchain network. They manage the architecture of the network, supervise the blockchain network. They work on consensus algorithms. For example, there's the proof of work algorithm in Bitcoin and set up blockchain protocols. A core blockchain developer works very much like a core web developer. Now, the main thing is that they both work on core concepts. Now, just like blockchain developers work on protocols, you have web developers working on protocols like HTTP or TCP IP and so on. Now, let's talk about a blockchain software developer. Now, they work on blockchain to create applications. Now, they create smart contracts, develop distributed applications and work on the front and back end application development. Blockchain software developers are also very similar to web application developers. Both of them create applications on a network that's already set up by core developers. So how do you become a blockchain developer? So before you start off on your path to becoming a blockchain developer, there are some things that you really have to know. Now we're going to talk about the prerequisites. First up, you have programming languages. Now it is absolutely necessary that you be well versed in programming languages before you can get onto blockchain development. Most blockchains are created in languages like Java, C++, JavaScript, Go, Python, C Sharp and so on. So let me emphasize how important it is that you know programming languages. Now for core blockchain development, any of these aforementioned languages will do the job for you. However, in case you have to create distributed applications and smart contracts on Ethereum, it is mandatory that you learn the programming language Solidity. Then you need to understand the fundamentals of object oriented programming. Now the concepts of object oriented programming, which anyone who codes will know is the wrapping up of data and functions into a single unit. This is exactly what blockchains function on. For example, you have the Ethereum block here. It has two components, data and function. The user details act as the data. Now this data includes the person who's sending the transaction or how much money they're planning to transfer. Then you have the function, which is the command to send and receive payments. Then you need to learn about flat and relational databases. Now blockchain was created on the basis of these two types of databases. A flat database stores data in a single table structure and a relational database uses a number of tables and can cross reference records across tables. So it is necessary that you understand how these two databases work to completely understand how blockchain was created from their concepts. Then you need to learn what data structures are. You need to understand the working of data structures like stack, linked list, queue, and so on. This is because blockchain by itself is a backlink list. Each block in a blockchain references the previous block. Now this is done by a field in the blocks header known as the previous hash that holds the hash value of the preceding block. Knowledge about web application development. By being well versed in web app development, you're opening yourself to a wide range of opportunities to create web and mobile applications using blockchain technology. Because regardless of whether the application works on blockchain technology, the front end can be created only with web application development. Then you need to know about networking. Blockchains work on the internet. So you need to understand the many concepts regarding networks. For example, how systems are able to communicate with each other, how the network works and so much more. 
Now, after you're done with all of this, you're ready to start your journey to become a blockchain developer. The first step is to understand the concepts of blockchain. Now, Satoshi Nakamoto's white paper, Bitcoin, a peer-to-peer -peer electronic cash system, gives a detailed account on how Bitcoin works and introduces us to the concept of blockchain. So if you want to learn firsthand how blockchain works from the creator of Bitcoin himself, I would suggest you go to Satoshi Nakamoto's paper. Next, you need to learn important terms related to blockchain. For example, what is a miner? What is a block? What is a public distributed ledger? Hash encryption? Proof of work? Mining? And so much more. Then you can learn how systems other than Bitcoin like Ethereum, Hyperledger, Hashgraph and so on use blockchain to work with their technology. The second step involves understanding the economics behind cryptocurrencies and blockchain. Blockchain technologies work on crypto economics, which is nothing but the combination of two words, cryptography and economics. Cryptography in blockchain involves hashing, digital signatures and proof of work. Hashing is involved in maintaining the privacy of a user within the network. This is made possible with the help of cryptographic algorithms. For example, in Bitcoin, we have the SHA-256 algorithm and ETHash in Ethereum. Digital signatures help validate a particular user within the network. This is made possible with the combination of the user's public and private keys. Proof of work involves miners around the world trying to solve a complex mathematical puzzle to be able to add a block to the blockchain. On the economic side, you need to understand how miners are incentivized. The users who add and take part in the blockchain are given cryptocurrencies. Now, people who take decisions also have the right to charge a fee for their service. For example, if a person has a block and he has to decide what transactions he's going to add to that block, he has the right to charge you some amount of money if you want your transaction to be added to his block. Good users of the network are rewarded with monetary compensation or the ability to take decisions. Bad users of the network have to pay a fine or have their rights to take decisions stripped away. Step 3 is to understand how cryptocurrencies work. With cryptocurrencies, there's a whole number of steps before a process is complete. You need to understand how each and every step works. For example, first how a sender begins the transaction to send money to the receiver, how the message is encrypted and transmitted across the network, how miners are able to verify that transaction, how the block is added to the blockchain, how money is deducted from each of the participants' wallets. You need to understand the relationship between each and every step of the process and how they interact with each other. Step 4. Getting some hands-on experience. Now, after you're done with all the steps that I mentioned before, this one's the hardest, practical application. So even if you know all the theory, if you don't have any practical experience, it won't have a very large impact. So you need to start coding and creating your own smart contracts. You need to create your own distributed applications on the Ethereum platform. Also, let me remind you, for you to be able to create smart contracts or distributed applications, you need to have learned the programming language Solidity. And finally, you can invest in Bitcoins or other cryptocurrencies so that you can have an understanding of how they actually work. Now, it's very important that you also keep yourself updated regarding cryptocurrencies and blockchains and Bitcoins by reading up on blogs and forums. You can take part in Discord chat rooms. You can use the Telegram application, which has a very active community on cryptocurrencies and blockchain. You can involve yourself in subreddits like r slash blockchain, r slash bitcoin and other related subreddits. You can get on CoinMarketCap that talks about market capitalizations of several cryptocurrencies, CoinMarketCal and so much more. There's an abundance of resources on the internet that you can take advantage of. Now, let's talk about the obstacles that you might face while learning blockchain. Now, you've noticed that blockchain isn't very easy. There's a lot of content to cover. Now, to make matters worse, you could also face some of these problems. First of them is outdated content. Now, the tutorials and content that you might find online cannot possibly keep up with the constantly changing technology. So, it's only natural that the content that you might get might be a little outdated, which isn't what you want. You want the latest and the most highest quality content. Secondly, lack of quality content. Now, there's an abundance of sources that you can learn from. And since there's such a wide variety, it's possible that you might end up using a type of source that's of low quality or of substandard quality. Now, let's talk about salaries that you can get in a blockchain job. 
Now, in the United States, blockchain developers earn $130,000 per annum, according to Burning Glass Technologies. In the more tech-oriented areas of US like Silicon Valley, New York and Boston, they earn up to $150,000 per annum. Several companies around the world have invested heavily into incorporating blockchain into their processes. Now you have companies like Alphabet, Bank of America, Wells Fargo, Apple, Microsoft and so on. So this is a clear indication that companies are very interested in hiring people who are skilled enough in the concepts of blockchain. And finally, how are companies using blockchain? Walmart uses blockchain to keep track of each and every step in the supply chain. With this, they are able to track down where the problem area is and to ensure that that problem is solved before it can happen again. You have JP Morgan Chase & Co. This company created their own blockchain application called Quorum that solves the processing that allows private transactions to take place in a group of participants whose identities are known. The Agricultural Bank of China created a loaning system using blockchain that aimed to help small and medium-sized agricultural businesses that didn't have a good credit record. Now how can Simply Learn help you? Simply Learn provides certification courses that give you an introductory or an advanced understanding into the concepts of blockchain. The introductory blockchain basics course provides 12 hours of self-paced learning and covers all the concepts related to Bitcoin and blockchain data structures. Moreover, it gives you an introduction into blockchain, Bitcoin, blockchain mining, buying and selling Bitcoins, emerging trends in blockchain and so much more. Now the advanced course or the blockchain certification training course provides 32 hours of instructor-led training, 50 plus hands-on exercises using blockchain technology, 9 practical projects covering Ethereum, Hyperledger and Bitcoin, case studies and so on. It also helps you understand Solidity programming, Ethereum coding, advanced smart contracts, Ethereum application architecture, real-life projects and so much more. The content of these courses are constantly updated to keep up with emerging trends in the market. Now Saurabh will take you through 30 hand-picked questions you might face in a blockchain interview. So let's get started and understand what kind of interview questions can come for a blockchain interview. So let's start with certain beginner level questions. Now when you face a blockchain interview, you can get different variety of questions. So we will be covering that what kind of questions can be asked at each level, beginner, intermediate and expert level. So one of the few questions which you could be asked is, what is the difference between blockchain and hyperledger? Blockchain is basically the underlying concept. Blockchain is a decentralized technology of immutable records called blocks which are secured using cryptography. Whereas Hyperledger is a platform or an organization that allows people to build private blockchain. So basically blockchain is a concept, is a technology. Using blockchain you can build public and private blockchains. But Hyperledger is a specific technology which allows you to build only private blockchains. Now blockchain is divided into public, private and consortium blockchains. Hyperledger is specifically a private blockchain technology with access to blockchain data is limited to predefined users and it is defined using certain configurations and programming. Blockchain can be used in multiple fields like business, governments, healthcare, other different kind of domains and etc. Hyperledger is primarily used in blockchain for enterprise based solutions. So wherever we are talking about public blockchain, blockchain is like usage of blockchain on internet and hyperledger based blockchain solutions are solutions which are meant for intranet within an organization, within a corporation. Second, how do you explain blockchain technology to someone who doesn't know it? So basically in simple terms, blockchain technology is a distributed ledger which stores transaction details in the form of immutable records, non-modifiable records which are called blocks which are secured using cryptography. So in order to explain simplistically, let's consider an example of a school where blockchain is similar to a digital report card of a student. Now each block contains students records which has a label stating the date and time of when the record was entered or when the record was registered on the blockchain. Now neither the teacher nor the student can modify the details of that block, cannot modify the record of report cards. Therefore the record becomes non-modifiable 
immutable immutable also the teacher owns a private key that allows him or her to make new records and the student owns a public key to view and access the report card at any time so basically the teacher owns the right to update the record but the student only owns the right to view the record now this method makes the data both accessible and secure and this is what blockchain brings on the table these are the primary attributes for which blockchain is getting widely adopted to have immutable records available for view to the public and available for updating in an untamperable way now what is a merkle tree merkle tree is a data structure which is used for verifying a block it is in a form of a binary tree containing cryptographic hashes of each block so basically a merkle tree is structured similar to a binary tree each leaf node is a hash of a block of transactional data so each leaf node is basically a transaction which is hashed and each non leaf node is a hash of its leaf node so basically hash aa is the hash of two blocks hash a and hash b merkle root or the hash root is the final hash of all the transaction hashes so basically merkle root is the hash of hash aa and hash bb so it encompasses all the transactions which are underlying all the non leaf nodes what do you mean by blocks in the blockchain technology what is the definition of a block so blockchain is a distributed database of immutable records called blocks which are secured using cryptography now as you see there are the certain attributes of a block which are displayed here you have previous hash transaction details nonce and a target hash value so a block is like a record of transactions each time a block is verified it gets recorded in chronological order on the main blockchain so as you can see as it is represented over here every time a new block is verified it gets added to the main blockchain with all those attributes populated now once the data is recorded it cannot be modified it cannot be changed now another question which could come into your interview is how is blockchain distributed ledger different from a traditional ledger it is a very important question we need to know the basic difference and justification if we have to move from a traditional database to a blockchain based distributed ledger what benefit it's bring on the table so certain differences which are very visible are transparency blockchain distributed ledger is highly transparent as compared to traditional database distributed ledgers are irreversible once any information is registered on a distributed ledger cannot be modified whereas on a traditional ledger it is reversible basically distributed ledger is more secure it uses cryptography every transaction is hashed and recorded in a traditional ledger the security can be compromised in a distributed ledger there is no central authority it's a distributed system the participants of the network holds the authority to maintain the sanity of the network and are responsible for validating the transactions whereas traditional ledgers are based on the concept of centralized authority and control and all the transactions are controlled by the centralized authority in a distributed ledger identities are unknown and are hidden whereas in a traditional ledger identities of all the participants have to be known before the transaction can happen in a distributed ledger there is not a single point of failure as the data is distributed information is shared across multiple nodes even if a single node fails the other nodes carry the same copy of the information whereas in a traditional ledger in a centralized database ledger based system that particular system becomes a single point of failure if the single system crashes the entire application or the entire network comes to a standstill ability to modify data no once the data or a transaction is registered it cannot be altered in a traditional ledger it is possible how validation is done so in a distributed ledger it is done by the participants of the network in a traditional ledger it is controlled by the centralized authority copy of ledger is shared amongst all the participants of a distributed ledger each participant consists the same information in the ledger in a traditional ledger only a single copy is maintained at a centralized location it is not shared amongst all the participants thereby again it remains as a single point of failure if you have any queries you can put your comments in the comment section of this video and we will definitely come back to you how can you identify a block 
what are the attributes of a block in order to understand it. So every block consists of four fields. It holds the hash value of the previous block. Therefore, it gets linked in a blockchain. It contains the details of the aggregated transactions which are aggregated in the block. It has a value called nonce. Nonce is a random value which is used to vary the value of the hash in order to generate the hash value less than the target. And then finally, you have a hash of the block itself. It is the digital signature of this block, a unique hash for this block. It is an alphanumeric value which is used to identify a block. So that is the identity of the block. The hash address is the unique identification of a block. It is a hex value of 64 characters that has both letters and digit. It is obtained by using SHA-256 algorithm. Now this is the way it is structured. The hash of the previous block, the transaction data and the nonce consolidate the header of the block. They all together are passed through a hashing function and then the hash value, the digital signature of the block is then generated. What is cryptography and what is its role in blockchain? Blockchain uses cryptography primarily to secure users' identities and ensure the transactions are done safely with the hash function. So all the user identities and the transaction on a blockchain are encrypted. Cryptography uses public and private keys to encrypt and decrypt data. So basically it uses the public and private key infrastructure in order to maintain the encryption of the information on a blockchain network. In blockchain network, Public key can be shared with all the Bitcoin users, all the blockchain users. So public key is just like your address, which you can share it with anyone. But a private key is like your password. It is kept secret with the user. So basically, blockchain uses cryptography to secure user identities and ensure transactions are done safely. And how does it do it? It uses SHA-256 algorithm, which is secure, which provides a unique hash output for every input. And it is a very popular algorithm. The basic feature of SHA-256 is that whatever input you pass, it will give you a standard output, alphanumeric output of 64 characters. So basically, it is a one-way function. You can derive an encrypted value from the input, but you can't do vice versa. Now, what are the different types of blockchains which exist? There are three different types of blockchains, public blockchain, private blockchain and consortium blockchain. Public blockchain, ledgers are visible to all the users on the internet and any user can verify and add a block of transactions to the blockchain. Basically, it's publicly available. Anyone can participate in the network and get hooked up. So examples are Bitcoin and Ethereum. Private blockchain ledgers are visible to all the users on the internet, but only specific users in the organization can verify and add transaction. So it's a kind of a permissioned blockchain, though the information can be available publicly, but the controllers and the validators of the blockchain are within the organizations and are predetermined. The example is Blockstack consortium blockchain. Here, the consensus process is controlled by only specific nodes. However, ledgers are visible to all the participants in the consortium blockchain. Example is Ripple. Now, what happens when you try to deploy a file with multiple contracts? In blockchain, deploying a file with multiple contracts is not possible. The compiler only deploys the last contract from the uploaded file and the remaining contracts are neglected and this is the way a smart contract is deployed on a blockchain network. Now very interesting question what is a genesis block it's a very important question and could be asked in an in interview multiple times. So basically genesis block is the first block in the blockchain which is also known as block zero. So as you can see the sequence number of this block is zero. And in blockchain, it is the only block that does not refer to any previous block. So the hash value of the previous block will be all zeros because it is the first block. Also, it defines parameters of the blockchain such as level of difficulty, consensus mechanisms, etc. to mine the block. So basically, it defines the primary attributes of the blockchain which is going to get initiated from the genesis block onwards. Now, let's look at some of the questions which would come if you are at an intermediate level. Now, how is the hash of a block signature generated? In blockchain, to generate a digital signature, transaction details are passed through a one-way hashing function. 
for example SHA-256. Then the output value is passed through a signature algorithm like ECDSA with the user's private key. Then the encrypted hash along with the other information such as the hashing algorithm is called as the digitally signed document and is called the digital signature. So this is the entire process of generating a digitally signed block. List down some of the extensively used cryptographic algorithms. These are the few popular algorithms which are extensively used. SHA-256, Bitcoin uses it. ITHash, Ethereum uses it. RSA is one of the other popular algorithm. Blowfish, Triple DES. So it's very important to memorize these algorithms, the names of these algorithms when asked. And SHA-256 and ITHash are used in two of the popular public blockchain networks. What is a smart contract and list some of its application. So smart contracts are self-executing contracts. These are basically digital contracts which contain the terms and conditions of an agreement between two parties, between two peers. Now some of the applications can be used in transportation where shipment of goods can be easily tracked using smart contracts. So as there's a movement of goods and it is exchanging hands between different parties, there could be need of a contract and a smart contract between the parties. It is also used in protecting copyrighted content like music or books or the literature which you have written. So smart contracts can protect the ownership rights. It can also be used in insurance. It can be used to identify false claims and prevent forgeries. Employment contract, smart contracts can be helpful to facilitate wage payments and it can be used as a proof of employment. Now another important question, what is Ethereum network and how many Ethereum networks are you familiar with? Ethereum is a blockchain based distributed computing platform featuring smart contract functionality that enable users to create and deploy their decentralized applications called dApps. There are three types of network in Ethereum. Live network, the main net. Then there are a couple of test networks like Robston, Coven and Rinkby. And then you can also create your own private network using Ethereum. Smart contracts are deployed on the main network. They are publicly available and can be used by others also. Test network allows you to run your smart contracts on a test net, validate the gas which is being used. You can just use these test networks as the main net, deploy your contracts, verify your decentralized application and then move on to the main net. Private networks are those which are not connected to the main network which run within the premises of the organization but carry the features of an Ethereum network. Now, where do nodes run smart contract code? Nodes run smart contract codes on a Ethereum virtual machine. It is a virtual machine designed to operate as a runtime environment for Ethereum based smart contracts. EVM is operated in a sandbox environment or isolated from the mainnet and it is a perfect testing environment. So you can download the EVM, run your smart contract locally in an isolated manner and once you have tested and verified it, then you can deploy it on the mainnet. Now a very important and a very good question. What is a dApp and how is it different from a normal application? We need to understand these differences very thoroughly in order to clear our interview. So a dApp is a decentralized application which is deployed using smart contract. The information on a dApp is distributed and shared. In a normal application, it has a centralized database which is running on a centralized server. So you have a single server and a single code which is maintaining the entire application. No information is shared and it is a single point of failure. A dApp has its backend code, a smart contract which runs on a decentralized peer-to-peer -peer network. In a normal application, it's a typical computer software application that is hosted on a central server. So if you see in the differences in the process, you have a front end, then in the middle, you have a smart contract which is acting as the backend code and then the entire transaction executed on a smart contract is shared between the blockchain participants in a P2P network. Whereas in a normal application, the front end interacts with a centralized API which performs basic CRUD operations, create, read, update, delete on a centralized database and it is a single copy of the information. Name some leading open source platforms for developing blockchain applications. So Ethereum is one of the popular platforms for building blockchain based applications and it is widely getting adopted. 
Eris is also used for building enterprise based solutions and also some of the widely used platforms for building blockchain are listed below. Hyperledger, multi-chain, open chain are available in the market. What is the very first thing you must specify in a Solidity file? Now it is necessary to specify the version number of Solidity at the beginning of a code as it eliminates incompatibility errors which can arise while compiling with another version. It is a mandatory clause which has to be there at the top of any Solidity code which you write and you need to mention the correct version number for which you have written the code. Now what is the difference between Bitcoin and Ethereum and it's a very important question which I also ask in a lot of interviews and it's important for you to remember these differences. So Bitcoin the concept is purely P2P currency based transaction but in Ethereum you can do both P2P currency transaction plus you can deploy smart contracts. Bitcoin is primarily working on proof of work consensus mechanism. Ethereum is shifting from proof of work to proof of stake. Bitcoin uses SHA-256 hashing algorithm whereas Ethereum uses ITHash. Time taken to mine a block currently on Bitcoin is approximately 10 minutes whereas in Ethereum it gets processed in 12 to 15 seconds. The reward for mining on Bitcoin as of today is 12.5 Bitcoin whereas in Ethereum it is 3 Ethers plus the transaction fees. On Bitcoin the transaction fees are optional whereas in Ethereum the fees is calculated based on the gas which is being consumed on a smart contract per transaction. Value of Bitcoin as of 21st August was captured at 6934 US dollars whereas Ethereum stands at 278 dollars. Now what is nonce and how is it used in mining? In blockchain mining is a process to validate transactions by solving a difficult mathematical puzzle called proof of work. Now proof of work is the process to determine a number a nonce that is the number along with a cryptographic hash algorithm to produce a hash value which is lower than a predefined target. Nonce is a random value which is used to vary the hash value so that the final hash value meets the hashing condition. So the nonce is the value which is being generated by the miner in order to guess the hash value which should be less than the target value and then only the miner can claim the reward for if he is mining a Bitcoin network of 12.5 BTC and a Ethereum network of 3 Ethers. Now let's look at some of the advanced level questions. Name the steps that are involved in a blockchain project implementation. So in a typical blockchain based project implementation we start off with requirement identification. We need to understand the problem and goal. We need to identify the suitable consensus mechanism. What is the most suitable platform which can solve the problem and then identify the implementation and deployment costs. We need to give an ROI to the client. Then we move on to the planning stage in this step. An individual evaluates all the requirements, lists them down, prioritizes them and decides a suitable blockchain platform which has to be used to implement this particular problem. Then kicks off the development and implementation of the project. You design the architecture, you design the user interfaces and start building the APIs. And then comes controlling and monitoring the project. You apply the proof of concept, you start off with that and then start building the application on top of it. And then once the basic version of the application is available, you start identifying bugs and start fixing them. Explain a real life use case where blockchain is being used. So supply chain is the biggest adopter of blockchain and as you can see as the raw material moves is exchanged between different entities in a supply chain. The traceability of that particular digital asset which in this case is raw material is a big case study on blockchain. In supply chain management smart contracts provide permanent transparency, traceability and validation of transactions shared by multiple supply chain partners. So at each level each supply chain partner has to register a transaction when it receives a product and then when it passes it on. So basically the purchaser when consuming the end product can see the entire journey of the product. List and explain the parts of EVM memory. So the memory of an EVM is divided into three parts storage, memory and stack. Storage values are stored permanently on the blockchain network and it is extremely expensive. So whenever you will try to modify a storage based variable you would have to pay gas for it. 
memory variables are temporary modifiable storage area it can be accessed only during the contract execution and once the execution is finished the data is wiped off vanished and it's lost stack on the other way is a temporary and a non modifiable storage here when the execution is completed the content is lost so basically memory and stack are relatively much cheaper than storage variables now what happens if the execution of a smart contract costs more than the specified gas initially your transaction will be executed but if the execution of a smart contract costs more than the specified gas then the miners will stop validating your contract the blockchain will record the transaction as failed as highlighted and also the user does not get a refund so it becomes of utmost important that when you are deploying your smart contract you do the calculation of the gas consumption in the most correct fashion what does the gas usage in a transaction depend on and how is transaction fee calculated so gas usage depends upon the amount of storage you are using if you are using storage based variables and the cost of the transactions will be high the gas will be high and the set of instruction codes used in a smart contract basically what operations you are performing on the storage based variables either they are costly and if you are using huge amount of storage variables then automatically the cost of your uh, smart contract will keep on increasing so basically the transaction fee is calculated in ethers which is given as the gas price which you have determined for your smart contract and multiplied by the gas limit and this is how your transaction fee is evaluated now what is fork and what are some of the types of forking so in simple terms updating a cryptocurrency protocol or code is called forking fork implies that a blockchain splits into two branches and forking is done when you want to modify certain attributes of an existing blockchain network it can happen when the participants of the network cannot come to an agreement with regards to either the consensus algorithm or they want new rules for validation so there are three types of forking hard forking soft forking and accidental forks what is the difference between proof of work versus proof of stake and it's a very important question in blockchain proof of work is the process of solving a complex mathematical puzzle called mining whereas proof of stake is an alternate to proof of work by which the blockchain aims to achieve distributed consensus in proof of work probability of mining a block is based upon the amount of computational work done by a miner basically it consumes huge amount of resources electricity resources and computational resources of the miner whereas in proof of stake the probability of validating the block relies upon the amount of token you own beforehand so the more the tokens you have the more the chance you get to validate a block so basically proof of stake has been introduced in order to reduce the pressure on the resources which has been put by the proof of work consensus algorithm miners spend a lot of computing power for solving the cryptographic puzzle along with the hardware and it's a huge cost so basically proof of stake was created as a solution to minimize the use of expensive resources spent in mining what is a 51% attack in blockchain 51% attack refers to a vulnerability where an individual or group of people can control the majority of the mining power or hash rate so basically they can take over the 50% of the blockchain network this would allow the attackers to prevent new transactions from being confirmed further they can double spend the coins now in 51% attack smaller cryptocurrencies are primarily being attacked which does not have a huge network which has a small consumer base what are function modifiers in solidity and mention the most widely used modifiers in solidity function modifiers are used to easily modify behavior of your smart contract it can be associated with a function and then whenever a function is called the modifier is called before the main function in simple terms it can build additional features or apply restrictions on the function of smart contracts the most extensively used function modifiers in solidity are view view functions are functions that cannot modify the state of a smart contract they are only read only functions here is an example you have a function get simply learn name and it is having a modifier view which only returns a value but you are allowed to use some inbuilt solidity functions like msg.sender but in case of pure 
pure functions are functions that neither read nor write the state of smart contracts they return the same result determined by its input variables so basically you can't even access the inbuilt functions of solidity so here you have a function called calculate you can only use the input variables you cannot use any of the inbuilt functions also of solidity now let's check look of an example in order to write a crowd sales smart contract code in solidity programming language so here in the example you have a smart contract where you have defined certain smart contract variables of solidity like address and uint now the address function is if you want to send your token to someone and your uint is the funding goal in ethers basically how much amount of ethers you want to generate in your crowd sale uh, project then what is the duration of your project then cost of each token in ethers then address of token used as reward so these are the primary attributes which you have defined then you have your public functions which are defined over here the beneficiary if successfully sent to the funding goal the deadline of your crowd sale and the price now here is your default function which is defined in a solidity contract which does not have any function name and is called by default in your smart contract if anyone invokes a method in your smart contract which does not exist in this function you are making sure that all the amount which has been passed to the smart contract is passed to your address basically you are the originator of your crowd sale function crowd sale smart contract so you should be receiving the amount then in your crowd sale smart contract you can have a method which is called as safe withdrawal and you have appended it with a modifier called after deadline so which basically checks that you can only do a withdrawal after the deadline has been achieved and in this function you are checking the balance then you are withdrawing that amount from the sender and transferring it to your own account as the sender has sent that amount to you so you do the basic validations whether the sender has that balance and then you do that transfer to your account thanks saurabh i hope this will help you in your interviews with that we have reached the end of this complete blockchain tutorial by simply learn i hope you guys enjoyed this video do like and share it Thank you for watching and stay tuned for more from Simply Learn.